Hello, and welcome to the third online forum of the Global Strategy Institute at KAIST on post-corona, post-human, medical and bioengineering revolution. We are coming to you from KAIST main campus in Daejeon, Korea, and streaming live on YouTube, Korea National Public TV, and Naver TV. My name is Seungbom Hong, and I am a faculty member at the Department of Material Science and Engineering. And I will be your moderator today. The Global Strategy Institute was launched in February of 2020 as a representative think tank of KAIST, providing insight into global and national issues using our own expertise in science and technology. We held two international forums in April and June this year on global cooperation in the coronavirus era and envisioning the future of education for non-contact society in the post-coronavirus era. Today, we are excited to have top experts from all over the world joining us for our third forum. We also have young scientists joining us as live panelists. Hello, everyone. Please wave a hello for us. Hi. OK. With the fear of a second wave and the hope of curing infectious diseases like COVID-19, our forum focuses on questions like, how can we avoid aging, cancer, and neurological diseases? And how can we provide solution for healthy human life in the future? Before we begin our plenary session, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to the president of KAIST, Professor Song Chul Shin, for his opening remarks. Please. Thank you, Professor Hong. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm so pleased to welcome you all once again uh, after only two months. Thank you to our Disney speakers, colleagues, and audience from around the world for virtually joining us today. My special thanks to Prime Minister Se Gyun Jung for being with us again following his inspiring message at the inaugural forum in March. I also would like to thank Director Jung Wo Kim, Professor Hun Son, and GIS GSI staff members for organizing this event so successfully. Despite every nation's best effort over the past half year, the world is experiencing the second wave of the COVID-19. These are very challenging times. In this critical juncture, I'm very honored to host these world-renowned speakers in the medical and bioengineering field at this forum. At this forum, we'll explore new strategies for innovation in science and bioengineering for containing COVID-19. We'll share our visions and insights on the future of humanity and how we can overcome the diseases with medical and bioengineering breakthroughs and extend life expectancies. Furthermore, this forum will present a diverse array of insights and policy vision for addressing infectious disease, aging, and rare disease that humanity long experienced in an attempt to pursue a better quality of life. I would like to thank all the distinguished speakers, especially Dr. Victor Zhao, President of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine, for joining us online. Dr. Zhao is well known for his initiative for the Global Health Risk Framework for the Future and Human Gene Editing Initiative, both critical for the success of medical and healthcare policies around the world. Futurist Thomas Frey from the Da Vinci Institute has inspired us with his deep insight into the prediction of a future technology and human lives. I look forward to his prediction on the future after COVID-19 and how the world will be transformed. Professor George McDonald Church from Harvard Medical School is a pioneering geneticist in the fields of personal genomics and synthetic biology. He first developed the direct genomic sequencing method in 1984. He had significantly contributed 
to the sequencing of genomes and to interpreting genome data in synthetic biology and genome engineering. We also have Senior Vice President Susan Tusi from Illumina, a leading global genome sequencing solution provider. She is joining us to share her vision regarding next generation sequencing and how it will affect our lives. Professor Kwang Soo Kim from Harvard Medical School, a KAIST alumnus, recently reported new discoveries for Parkinson's disease treatment, reprogramming a patient's own skill cells to replace cells in the brain. Well, we also have very promising young scientists and investigators at the station from KAIST and around the world who will talk on future innovation strategies for healthcare and biotechnology. This is a guest. We are living in this new normal, a time of full of uncertainties. The one thing for sure is only advancements of science and technology will deliver us from this crisis. Only medical breakthroughs can help us regain our high quality of life. We all know unwavering innovation in the research sector and global collaboration will realize these breakthroughs. How to improve life quality and benefit humanity are long-standing research topics that KAIST is pursuing. KAIST already launched post-COVID R&D initiative in May. This is our innovative science new deal that will drive new growth engines in biomedical and healthcare industries. For this New Deal initiative, KAIST will concentrate on antivirus technology, infectious disease-related big data management, and non-contact service platforms as key future R&D areas. A number of KAIST medical researchers and bioengineers are also making significant progresses in antivirus and bioengineering research. I look forward to many global collaborations with other researchers bearing fruits very soon. This global pandemic crisis has pushed us to make a revolution in medical and bioengineering disciplines and has opened a new chapter for human healthcare. I hope this forum will serve as another opportunity to accelerate the advancement of medical and bioengineering breakthrough to benefit all of humanity. Thank you once again to all participants online around the world. Thank you very much, President Chin, for your opening remarks. I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank you for supporting our GSI International Forum. Our next guest is the Prime Minister of the Republic of Korea, Dr. Sehun Chung. It is my great honor to introduce you to the Prime Minister Chung for his welcome remarks. Welcome, Prime Minister Chung. A distinguished guest here at home and abroad, greetings. Allow me to offer my sincere congratulations on convening the third Global Strategy Institute International Forum 2020. It has been five months since the inaugural forum in April when I last greeted you. I want to thank KAIST President Shin Song Chol, KTV President Song Kyung Hwan, and all those who put together this meaningful event as we work to overcome the COVID-19 crisis. I would also like to thank Executive Director Thomas Frey of the Da Vinci Institute presenting online today as a speaker, and all the experts participating from the world's leading biohealth institutions, including Harvard University, Stanford University, and the U.S. National Institute of Health, among others. Nations around the world are now redoubling cooperative efforts to develop COVID-19 treatments and vaccines and make them widely available. 
As an active participant in international solidarity and cooperation, the Korean government has donated 50 million U.S. dollars to the International Initiative Act, which was launched to ensure global fair access to COVID-19 vaccines and treatments. Recently, I visited on-site to witness the many efforts of Korea's pharmaceutical and biotech businesses to develop a COVID-19 cure and vaccine. Furthermore, the government is advancing plans to establish an Institute of Basic Virology to effectively support research on infectious diseases and viruses. And looking forward to a post-COVID-19 era when novel infectious diseases can be expected to arise. It is also important to promote innovation in medicine and biotechnology to address cancer, aging, and incurable diseases. Korea is currently devoting serious effort to research in the fields of cutting-edge regenerative medicine and biotechnology as they pursue fundamental treatments. In fact, the future of biotechnology served as a the theme of discussion at a recent Thursday talk that I preside over weekly as Prime Minister. Cutting-edge regenerative medicine may provide the hope of a treatment opportunity to patients with rare and incurable diseases, while it serves as an opportunity for the industry to grow. At the same time, concerns over safety and potential for medical polarization call for a balanced approach. I hope that today's third GSI IF 2020 will bring forth balanced and practical discussions about the value and the limits of medical biotechnology. Moreover, I hope that in restoring humanity to an ordinary everyday beyond COVID-19, all of you taking part today will ultimately demonstrate the power of our collective intellect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister Chung, for your thoughtful message. Next, I'm very pleased to have with us Dr. Victor Zhao, the President of the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Zhao is past President and CEO of Duke University Health System, former Chairman of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and past chairman of the Department of Medicine at Stanford University. Today, he will give us a welcome speech on our forum. Hello, Victor, and thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, President Shin. It's a great honor to speak at the third international forum of the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm going to touch on today on the potential of science and technology addressing a very important issue, which is the aging population. Let me therefore first put on my slide. This conference title is Post-Corona, Post-Human, Medical and Bioengineering Revolutions. What I want to add is the emphasis on charting the future of health, healthy longevity. So we all know why it's so important to think about COVID. I think many of us are very occupied by trying to address this very devastating issue. Innovation has shown during COVID very brightly in being able to address issues of social 
contact, contact tracing, social distancing, telemedicine using digital innovation. There's innovation testing. There's innovation in treatment. An important vaccine has demonstrated that it's possible that within less than a year, we'll have a vaccine that's effective and safe. This is mainly due to the tremendous progress in science innovation, particularly new platforms of vaccine development and others. So I think we should celebrate about innovations in science and technology during COVID times, but it's also important to remember that much of this advances that we see is related to actually more than half a century of the evolution of uh, science and technology. This slide shows you, for example, that two revolutions has been set by the title of this meeting. One is a biomedical science revolution, genomics, molecular and cell biology, starting with the discovery of DNA in 1953. Second is a digital technology computation information revolution with the first commercial available computer in 1951 and onwards to where we are today, including artificial intelligence, big data, you name it. But I think what's really exciting is the convergence of these two revolutions, a biomedical science and a digital information uh, revolution. This convergence was written by our National Academy, as well as by MIT and others, as the future of particularly uh, in health and medicine. So, for example, if you look at where we are today, based on this 50 some years of revolution, we now have an armamentarium of breakthroughs, technology that's just ne never been thought of before, like genetic engineering, including genome editing, regenerative medicine immunotherapy, synthetic biology, precision medicine, to name a few. On the other hand, if you look at technology, it's applied to the neurosphere and brain machine interface and many others, but also robotics, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So it's generally speculated that if all this convergence of technology and science come together, it can transform the future of health and medicine. First, certainly you can think that is possible to manage all, if not most of the diseases. But also it may be able to cure or prevent diseases using things like genome editing, et cetera. That we will be able to use data and technology to effectively predict and prevent diseases. Furthermore, the way care is delivered, particularly with remote technology, sensing, et cetera, and where care is delivered, and who is cared by, care by will all change. Ultimately, we'll have a seamless continued care connected through information, data, et cetera. And the insights from large data, artificial intelligence, digital health assistance can shape healthcare in clinical decision processes, as well as individual personal decisions. This is all very exciting, something that we all look forward to in the near future. But I think one of the beneficial outcomes of the advances in public health, hygiene, and medicine and technology is a much longer life expectancy. In fact, globally, we've seen a doubling of life expectancy in the last century or so. And this slide shows you the increasing global aging population. On the upper circle, you see right here is the number of people over 65 is rising exponentially. So that by 2050, about 20% of population, 2 billion of the world will be over 65. At the same time, you see that fertility is dropping so that by the time of uh, 2050, again, less than 6% of the population will be under age of five. What I think is alarming is this slide right here, which shows the cross between, in 2020, the year we are now living in, we see a cross between, uh, in fact, older population and the younger population. At the bottom is a, what they call a demographic uh, profile, what we call age pyramid. As you can see in South Korea, 
This is becoming an increasing issue. In 1958, most of the population is young, as shown in this pyramid at the bottom. In 2018 now, many of the population is moving towards middle age to older age. It's predicted by 2045 you have an inverted pyramid, where most of the population is actually over 65. Now, aging is not a problem itself because I'm over 65 and I feel very good. I can do a lot of things. But the population aging does impact families, communities, societies, industry, and economy. For example, the aging population, as you know, have three, four times the amount of chronic diseases, obesity, hypertension, uh, cancer, Alzheimer's. It puts a tremendous strain on the healthcare delivery system. And of course, it can eventually cause a lot of disruption in the financing. It puts tremendous pressure on family structure relationship, social infrastructure, social insurance, and importantly, it also result in a shrinking workforce. That is fewer younger people and a lot more older people. So I think what I want to talk about is to how to apply the advanced science and technology that we're here to talk about today, to look at how to improve health span of the population, particularly the older population, so that they be healthier, less disease, more productive, and being able to function effectively in society. So the hypothesis here is say by delaying or interrupting biologic processes associated with disease, and aging, we can prevent illness and disease and therefore a loss of function. But also beyond biology, using technology to transform the way we, the way we age, that is can ease activities of daily living, improve the quality of life, mobility and accessibility to healthcare of the elderly. So let's take a look at two areas. First area that you're gonna talk a lot about today in neurodegenerative disease. This slide shows you that on one side, on the left side, is the rising incidence of Alzheimer's, Parkinson, and uh, ALS. On the right side, you can see are the slides that show you the nine hallmarks of uh, these diseases, because the the biggest risk factor for these disease is age. And the nine hallmarks of aging and new gen disease are things like genomic instability, telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, mitochondrial dysfunction, et cetera. So now you can imagine by understanding these processes and interrupting them, we may be able to prevent the progression of disease and not treat disease, or maybe altogether prevent disease. This leads me to think about the bigger picture, which is the a biology of aging per se. If one really understands the process of aging, and one can, in fact, either enhance health span or delay aging or interrupt the process. You can imagine that, in fact, this would be extremely beneficial in the sense of reducing the infirmities of aging and improving health span. I listed here, by no means exhaustive, the many things which I already know in terms of cell senescence, autophagy, metabolic and mitochondrial dysfunction regeneration of cells and tissues, DNA repair and damage and repair, telomere dysfunction, a whole series of longevity genes, and of course, epigenetics. So I think this presents tremendous area of opportunity for science and technology and research. By targeting reversing pathways involved in the aging process, using molecular therapeutics, geno genome editing, regenerative medicine, Gene therapy. In fact, one of your speakers, my friend George Church, published last year a paper in which a single administration by AAV of three genes into mice can actually greatly prevent a series of uh, diseases from developing. Uh, these are diseases related to aging. But also, let's talk about tissue bioengineering, which is a big part of this meeting. And finally, advanced technology. I mentioned already data, digital technology, artificial intelligence, uh, automation, biosensors, and brain-computer interface. 
So with that background, I'll say that this meeting should be discussing how these science and technology can be now mobilized to improve health span of the population, particularly as you age. At the US National Academy of Medicine, we have taken on two big projects to address this issue. One is the grand challenge called healthy longevity. What we want to do is comprehensively address the challenge opportunities presented by global aging, being able to address not only biologic processes, but social, economic, political, and other environmental factors that affect the health of the older population, but importantly, catalyze breakthrough ideas and research that can extend human health span, generate transformative and scalable innovation, and form a dynamic network of support for healthy longevity. So what we did a year ago is to launch this big project called Global Competition, in which we have mobilized eight funding agencies and covering about 50 countries and territories. This launch a year ago started the process of a competition. You can see in this pyramid, the bottom is called Catalyst Award, where we're giving up $50,000 seed dollars for bold innovative ideas in different parts of the world. And we are funding about 450 such Catalyst Award, and already we have thousands of applications in our first round. The idea is that these ideas, these new ideas would catalyze and innovation and bold ideas. And those which are meritorious will get the accelerated award, which is shown in the second level, which will be 500,000 to a million dollars. And to enable them to move this forward and even commercialize. And then ultimately there will be a grand prize of four to $5 million to get the most breakthrough uh, research advanced that can really improve health span, particularly in older population. The other initiative I want to tell you about is called the Healthy Brain Global Initiative, which I'm very pleased to be co-chair with my good friend, Garen Stacklin, the founder of One Mind. This initiative, which is going to be a, which is, by the way, a multilateral independent initiative, but co-convened by National Health Medicine and One Mind, and now on its own leg in terms of organization, have this bold idea of new science, new finance, new trajectory, life trajectories, $10 billion financing mechanism in order to fuel an unprecedented increase in delivery of evidence-based intervention, brain science breakthrough, that will actually improve the lives of those with mental neurological disorders and bend the unsustainable three trillion global cost curve per year, particularly in low, middle, and even high income countries. We have the endorsement participation, as you can see, of many partners, including WHO, World Economic Forum, UNICEF, the World Bank, as well as uh, the participation of Bank of America, NIH, Welcome Trust, and many others, as you can see this slide. But the important issue is to be able to find financial resources over a 10 year period to enable integrated multidisciplinary science from cellular to society, from biologic to behavioral. So in other words, implementation, translational and discovery sciences. And importantly, we're gonna use a portfolio management approach whereby the idea would be that with this amount of investment, that one in fact invests in low income countries, low middle income countries and high income countries, so that together we can totally transform mental health. Now, how are we gonna raise the money? This is the concept of a 10 year financing mechanism using things like 10 to 30 year bonds, raising money through sovereign wealth funds, capital investment, but also philanthropy and donor, impact investment, and many others. And we're well on our way with the Bank of America willing to underwrite this, and in fact, the World Bank uh, playing a big role in possibly issuing the bonds. So this is a very exciting time for us. And what I want to end by is this slide. to show you that at the end of the day, we age, it's called chronologic age. It depends on the day we're born towards 
increasing number of years that we have accumulated, if you will. But it's important to change it to biologic age. That is, as you can see in the slide, that you remain healthy despite your age. And by bringing science technology to this field, particularly in increasing health span, I would imagine that not only do we have improved population of the older, but it applied much earlier, the entire lifespan, so that we have much healthier population, and then we'll be happier and more productive. So thank you very much for attention. Thank you. Thank you, Victor, for your wonderful welcome remarks. Now, let's move on to our plenary session. Our first speaker is Thomas Fry, the senior futurist, founder and executive director of the Da Vinci Institute. As a top-rated futurist, his talks have captivated people ranging from high-level government officials to executives in Fortune 500 companies. He will be sharing his predictions on the future of healthcare enabled by medical and bioengineering. Please. Hi, I'm futurist Thomas Fry. I'd like to congratulate KAIST on hosting the third international forum. It's been a particularly tough year for hosting events, and I sincerely appreciate the effort it has taken you to produce this event. I would also like to thank President Chin for extending the invitation to me. It is indeed a great honor to be part of this. You've accomplished much over the years, and it's important to note that KAIST has been ranked 39th in the QS World University rankings and is also the best engineering university nationwide. KAIST GSI was established in February of this year with the goal of becoming one of the leading global science and technology think tanks in the world. I wish you the best as you move forward on this endeavor. For people all over the planet, the COVID crisis is a deeply personal experience and virtually nothing in our world will remain untouched. It's as if the game of life was thoroughly shaken up and an entirely new set of rules was dumped onto the table for us to deal with. As we stare at this new rule set, yes, we can spend our time complaining about it or we can seize the golden opportunity, reinvent business and run with it. After all, during periods of great chaos comes great opportunity. The only problem, most opportunities are hard to spot, especially in today's environment. They look different, they feel different, and they come all wrapped up in a legacy of shattered hopes and dreams. Pre-COVID success stories are vastly different than the ones we'll experience moving forward. Think of this as the end of business as we know it and the beginning of something else. Suddenly, a sharing economy is bad. Stadiums are bad, in-person events, airports, crowded expos, parades, professional sports, movies, and comedy clubs have all been touched by the social distancing wand of disapproval. Every post-COVID success story will come from those who manage to cut through the fog of uncertainty, make the right decisions, and build a durable strategy that can survive the tumultuous times ahead. But here's the problem. The end of COVID will be fuzzy. There will be no sign saying you have reached the end. Normal life begins now. Instead, the entire planet will have to feel its way into the post-COVID world, a process that will take years for us to understand what we went through and what it all means. And we are looking to storytellers to help guide our thinking. We now have a massive production gap in both television shows and movies, and the opportunities are huge for those who can tap into the zeitgeist of post-COVID thinking. Storytellers will need to pay close attention because our definition of heroes, success, and achievement is changing. So are our thoughts on villains, virtue, and passion in our quest for accomplishment. 
we're desperately seeking new forms of leadership, decision making, and ways of setting priorities and getting things done. And the old way of thinking about Hollywood and the rest of the movie industry just won't cut it anymore. We no longer feel comfortable with our old sense of morality, purpose, pursuits, and relationships. Our global consciousness has changed, and this is the perfect time for a new breed of storytellers to pave the way. So let's take a look at some of the underlying trends happening in the world. The coronavirus will prove to be the most expensive crisis in human history, even more expensive than World War II. It's impossible to have this many top-down decisions without creating a massive number of unintended consequences. And yes, we will be cleaning up messes from these decisions for years to come. Businesses were simply never designed to be shut down and restarted months later. For this reason, I put together a few predictions about the world after COVID. We are experiencing the biggest job transition in all history. Most of us have had time to step back and think, and as we've reassessed our lives, we've decided to do something different. This will include new jobs, new businesses, and living in new houses and new cities. We're desperately seeking new lifestyles with more meaning and purpose. We will see a mass exodus from the inner cities. 30 to 40% of inner city retail stores will fail and never reopen. Contact phobia will permeate our thinking for generations to come. Shaking hands has suddenly become a symbol for you're an idiot. Universities are struggling and roughly 50% will close permanently by 2030. By 2030, the largest company on the internet will be an education-based company that we haven't heard of yet. More on that later. The coronavirus will be the greatest source of conspiracy theories in all history. There will be a lot of finger pointing moving forward. At the same time, certain technologies are moving exponentially faster. Outbreaks in meat processing plants have caused us to look for alternatives. Lab-grown meat production facilities are ramping up and will be common by 2025. Remote work is here to stay. Productivity will be data-driven and the number one goal for businesses in 2020 and beyond will center around building and rebuilding trust. The rapid increase in working from home has incentivized bad actors. Quantum computing will make all current encryption systems breakable by 2025. We will all need to switch to quantum level encryption before then. Electric and driverless cars are ramping up in a huge way. The last internal combustion engine will be produced around 2025. Driverless technology will be the most disruptive in all history. It will touch the lives of every person on planet Earth over the next decade. With COVID, the ever-present infection numbers, hospitalizations, and more ominously, deaths, daily counts have taken on a significant role in our world. But let's put those in context with another count. 151,600 is the number of people that die every day in the world. Every 10 seconds, another 17 people die. In rough terms, 25,000 die of cancer, 30,000 die of heart failure, others die from old age, infectious disease, car accidents, childbirth, suicides, gunshots, or any number of different causes. The ending of human life is a sobering reality and it's happening relentlessly every second of every day. Whenever I get lulled into a false sense of this will never happen to me, I realize the same number begins its countdown every morning of every day. There are no exceptions. So has the death rate gone up or down during the coronavirus? We don't have accurate enough statistics to work with, but there are some interesting arguments to be made that it has actually gone down because fewer people driving means fewer car accidents. Fewer people working means fewer accidents on the job and so on. But what is the role of our healthcare system in this number? As a society, we are grieving all of our losses, but we especially abhor premature deaths all of the ones that could have been prevented. We go out of our way to guard against disease, 
attending to wounds after an accident and protecting ourselves from those who wish us harm. But it occurs to me that death might not be inevitable. What if no one ever needed to die? What if our healthcare system got really good at curing disease, repairing people after an accident, finding solutions for mental health issues, and even criminal behavior? What if we even found an antidote for human aging? That means no person would ever have to die, ever. Should that be the goal of the healthcare system? Well, why not? Even if the odds of accomplishing a never die healthcare system were a trillion to one, should it still be our goal? And two emerging technologies, digital twins and CRISPR, may make this much more attainable. Healthcare is transitioning from an industry dominated by pharmaceuticals to an industry run on data. Over the coming years, we will see the integration of tiny sensors in equipment and throughout our bodies. This will give us the ability to add far more precision to every medical diagnosis. Rather than having doctors prescribe either 200 or 400 milligrams of a drug because those are the only doses currently being offered by pharmaceutical companies, we will be moving quickly towards diagnostic equipment that can tell us we need precisely 327 milligrams or 162 milligrams and have a dispensing system capable of producing that exact dosage. As these sensors become tinier and more precise, we will witness an explosion of digital twin technologies. The digital twin is a virtual representation of a real life physical product, building, or person. Currently, Digital twin technology is being used to monitor large pieces of equipment like tractors, cruise ships, and turbines in a power plant. It allows operators to remotely monitor equipment and processes in real time, even from a remote location. With improvements in digital twin technology, we will soon enter an era of remote robotics, where we can see what the machine is seeing and feel what the machine is feeling as we operate equipment remotely. This is already happening with surgical robots, but will become far more pervasive over time. This brings up a number of important questions. At what point do we no longer need to have an operator in the vehicle? How long before planes, as an example, can be operated remotely with pilots that are on the ground? How long before digital twin technology is common in humans? And this naturally raises the question of how long will it be before doctors can diagnose a person's condition and remotely monitor their health through their digital twin. Since Korea is already a leading designer and manufacturer of sensor technology, digital twins offer us a rich future for those businesses. Of course, digital twins can only help diagnose problems. To solve them, we are seeing an explosion of powerful new tools like CRISPR. CRISPR technology involves a series of DNA reading and editing tools like gene scissors, bioprinters, and molecular scalpels that are being used to solve a wide range of healthcare problems. It's become a Swiss army knife for gene therapy world. The true game-changing potential for CRISPR is that it allows scientists to perform cut and paste-like functions to remove existing or add new gene sequences to our DNA in ways that may be faster, cheaper, and easier and more precise. Here are eight ways that it's being used. CRISPR can correct the genetic errors that cause disease even before a baby is born. Catching the mutation in the earliest stage of embryonic development will either reduce or eliminate the need for treatment later in a person's life. CRISPR can eliminate the microbes that cause a disease and even COVID-19, but much more work is still needed to prove out these strategies. It's being used to develop clean meats. Several Silicon Valley startups are experimenting with CRISPR to make lab-grown chicken, pork, beef, and fish. CRISPR will be used to develop healthier foods. Unlike GMO operations, which are crude and sloppy, CRISPR is a very precise way of re-engineering plants. CRISPR may even be used in the revival of extinct species. Some scientists believe that bringing back the woolly mammoth 
could actually help keep some of our climate changes at bay. CRISPR may eliminate the threat of disease spreading mosquitoes. Currently, mosquitoes are the world's most dangerous animals. CRISPR engineers are testing techniques to reduce their ability to spread dangerous infectious disease among humans. And this includes diseases such as malaria, dengue fever, and yellow fever. CRISPR has the potential to make transplantable organs safer and more readily available. Currently, 20 people die every day waiting for a transplant. CRISPR could help people have healthier babies as well as designer babies. The age of superhumans cannot be far off. As with all new technologies, we now have a new starting line and Korea is well positioned to take the lead on many of these areas of CRISPR technology. Demographics is a tricky subject, especially when it comes to projecting out over the next 80 to 100 years. But children born today will likely live more than 100 years, and birth rates are driven more by culture than they are by trends. In his August 12th appearance at the World Artificial Intelligence Conference in Shanghai, Elon Musk emphatically stated, I think the biggest problem the world will face over the next 20 years is population collapse. And he emphasized the word collapse. At today's birth rate, over 20 countries will lose half their population by 2100. This includes Korea, Italy, Japan, Poland, Portugal, Spain, and Thailand. China's population will fall from 1.4 billion people today to 730 million in 80 years. It is the children and grandchildren of today's young people that will determine the fate of our world, and our kids are being born primarily in Africa and parts of Asia. Pay close attention to these six countries, Nigeria, Congo, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Angola, and Pakistan. The future of our planet is happening inside of these countries. While fertility rates around the world are plummeting, over half of all the new babies born in the world are being born in these six countries. According to Pew Research, these six countries are projected to account for over half of the world's population growth through the end of this century. At the same time, very little money is being spent in educating this future half of the planet. According to the UN, nearly 69 million new teachers are needed. In Africa, where they have the fastest growing school age population, 20% of all kids do not attend any school whatsoever. It's important to understand that as humans, we have a mandate to pass our learning from one generation to the next. But very little of this learning is reaching remote regions of the world. For this reason, we are on the verge of an education explosion unlike anything we've ever imagined. In 2012, I was asked to speak at a TEDx event in Istanbul on the future of education. Several times throughout my talk, I touched on the topic of teacherless education. After my presentation, I was approached by a Google executive who explained why teacherless education was so important to them. He said their team at Google is looking for ways to educate the people of Africa, but very few teachers actually want to move to Africa. The conversation was brief, but he framed the problem very succinctly. No, most teachers don't want to move to Africa. They also don't want to move to Siberia, to Bangladesh, to Pakistan, or the Amazon rainforest. There are lots of places in the world that teachers don't want to move to. By some counts, we are short 69 million teachers globally, and a full 23% of kids growing up today don't attend any school whatsoever. If we continue to insert a teacher between us and everything we have to learn, we cannot possibly learn fast enough to meet the demands of the future. Teaching requires experts. Teacherless education uses experts to create the material, but doesn't require the expert to be present each time it's presented. Education is now on the verge of a major transformation, and AI 
faith-based teacherless education systems are quickly taking center stage. If we apply AI to teacher bots, their primary task will be to find the fastest way to teach students. Over time, AIs will learn every student's interests, their proclivities, their idiosyncrasies, preferred tools, personal reference points, and how to keep them engaged in learning, even in the face of distractions. AI will quickly learn what skills we're proficient in, what skills we're deficient in, and what's needed to bring us up to speed. It will quickly learn how and when to schedule our next training and when we've mastered the topic. Throughout this training curve, individual learning will begin to scale far faster than anything we've dreamed possible, four times, six times, perhaps even 10 times faster than anything today. Completing a four-year college degree in one to two months will be entirely possible with this new form of AI learning systems. By creating high-speed AI learning systems, we remove all of our past limitations. By 2030, the largest company on the internet will be an education-based company that we haven't heard of yet. In my mind, this will be the largest opportunity in the online world where no one has quite cracked the code yet. But once somebody figures it out, it will scale very quickly. The new world in the wake of COVID will be dramatically shaped by technologies like digital twins, CRISPR, and AI-based teaching as it rushes towards the inevitable demographic shifts that will be reshaping nations. I wish the good people of Korea the very best as we continue this transition into the radically new world that lies ahead. Thank you very much, Thomas. It was indeed a captivating presentation, and it was a thought-provoking and ins inspiring talk. Never die healthcare system, if it becomes a reality, will be a true paradigm shift, as death will not become a sobering moment of reality, but an option to all of us. And at that time, the ethics will change in the direction we're not familiar with. And also AI-based teacherless learning system will be an important part at KAIST in the future. Now, before moving on to the second speaker, I'd like to spend some time with Thomas uh, with one Q&A session. The question is, it is true that COVID-19 will bring significant change in people's lifestyles, values, thoughts, etc. What change do you think will happen in the post-COVID-19 era? When do you expect this disorder and distrust can be settled down. In response to this question, Thomas provided his reply as follows. During the early stages of COVID, governmental leaders felt great urgency to make decisions quickly. Leaders around the world were applauded for taking quick, decisive action. However, even after urgency began to subside, these same leaders started feeling increasingly comfortable with taking immediate action. The massive number of top-down decisions being made without democratic decision-making process and public input will create a huge number of unintended consequences. That said, the best way to change people's thinking is to change the narrative. For example, as the economy falters and unemployment rises, governments will be searching for a number of mega projects, including large infrastructure projects and scientific projects. For mega projects to be successful, they will need to capture the imagination of diverse group of people seem intuitively useful and put many people back to work. Now, we will welcome Dr. George Church as our next speaker. Dr. Church is the Robert Winthrop Professor of Genetics at Harvard Medical School. Church is one of the pioneers of CRISPR gene editing tool for genome editing and stem cell engineering. He is known to be 
the most prominent figure of leading geneticists in the world and will give us a talk on testing molecular editing and cell therapies. We are pleased to have you join our forum today. And just for your information, our forum is live broadcast through Na YouTube, Korea National Public TV, and Naver TV. So you may start whenever you're ready, please. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So uh, it's, been, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, it, listening to Victor Zhao and Thomas Fry, they introduced some of the topics that, that my laboratory uh, works on, including aging reversal, the um, mammoth CRISPR, um, COVID-19, um, and so on. And, I'll, and I, so I'll give you a deeper insight into how these things are happening and moving forward. Um, so the most expensive uh, therapies in history are now um, uh, orphan drugs, in particular gene therapies, but they don't have to be. They uh, um, can, the, they're mainly the rare uh, versions of these that are expensive, and we can deal with both the rare and the common, uh, as I've outlined on, on this slide, and, uh, and it will be uh, the theme for the talk. Rare genetic diseases can be uh, greatly reduced in, in, in cost from millions of dollars per lifetime to hundreds by preventative um, matchmaking and, and other st stages. Similarly, for infectious diseases, prevention has uh, tremendous advantages, and I'll illustrate this in terms of a bioweather map, sort of the obvious equivalent of a weather map uh, tracking pathogens real time, um, all the time, all the pathogens. We could also increase, uh, decrease costs by increasing the success rate via machine learning and libraries. I'll show you that in just a moment. And then finally, common diseases uh, are, uh, common diseases are age affected. In fact, age affects almost everything, as, as uh, pre previous speakers have pointed out. Even, even falling down is uh, increased by, and um, the consequences are higher uh, in an age-related way. COVID-19 is age, very age-dependent. But the opportunity here is that age-related diseases um, can be uh, cost-effective because since everybody uh, is susceptible and everybody needs these uh, uh, cures, the R&D costs, the research and development costs can be spread out over many different. Um, these are some of the gene editing therapies that we and our colleagues have worked on. Um, they ha the first few have in common, uh, whether they use CRISPR or other editing methods, that they either cause uh, cutting or they cause um, uh, small changes, uh, some of them uh, inefficiently, um, some of them restricted in the kinds of changes you can make, for example, just A's to G's or C's to T's. A more uh, general method we call gene writing, and an example of that has come forward uh, in the f uh, form of Tessera Therapeutics. But the, but the point is, these technologies keep changing, um, and they change in an exponential way, which is quite interesting. Um, this, these are the exponential curves, uh, factors of 10 on the y-axis uh, over very short periods of time. Uh, this is both for reading and writing DNA, reading, writing, editing, um, where we've seen improvements, of, for example, from $3 billion for a poor, non-clinically uh, valuable uh, genome to in the, in the low hundreds uh, of dollars uh, today. And this exponential is due mainly to multiplexing, not so much automation, um, although that's some important as well. But the, but the 10 to 60 million fold reduction has been due to uh, multiplexing. Now we can apply these exponential technologies. Um, fortunately, they now uh, are routine. To, to, uh, to unexpected and, and disastrous uh, incidents as um, SARS-CoV-19. 
uh, sorry, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, these can be, uh, our lab is pursuing treatments which include neutralizing antibodies and peptides uh, taken from receptors. And we're also looking at, at, at vaccines uh, as preventative uh, for the treatment along with, with uh, testing and mass. Uh, so we have here this rapid deployment vaccine, uh, which is intranasally delivered, synthetic peptides, especially focusing on CD8 epitopes, chitosan nanoparticles. These are categorically safe, um, but we need to really focus on uh, antibody-dependent enhancement and long-term studies are really needed to, for each of the uh, vaccines, uh, no matter how promising they look. In addition to prevention and treatment, um, but via prevention via vaccines, we can also do prevention via um, analytics. Um, when we have uh, some sort of respiratory disturbance, it could be completely non-infectious or it could be fatal. So we, have, we need to think beyond or including this crisis, but beyond it, we should be constantly monitoring in a cost-effective way something that could be a thousand times less expensive than this single pathogen problem, something a thousand times cheaper would be uh, monitoring of every family on a weekly basis, possibly every individual on a daisy, daily basis, as the, the cost comes down as, as we are used to. And this could be real time, it could be portable, it could be um, uh, on your body the same way that cell phones are, are very commonly, it could be even part of your cell phone as, as you can see in this, these pictures here, it could be two prime candidates for this are nanopore technology and molecular transistors, like the polymerase transistor from Roswell. <coughs> I mentioned multiplexing. We can now mix together via barcoding. So this is molecular barcoding. It's very similar to the barcodes that you see in the store, but at the, it's invisible and, and uh, molecular. You can add together uh, samples from multiple patients and detect multiple pathogens and even their resistance to drugs uh, all at once in a single run of an instrument. Um, we can read out uh, the finest details now at 10 to 20 nanometer resolution. This is um, molecular, super molecular re resolution for DNA, RNA, and protein, the central dogma. Um, I'll show you one slide each uh, of, of uh, how far this technology has gone. You can think of it as a, a very high resolution microscope with a very large number of colors. Um, this is work from, uh, that we've done in collaboration with Ting Wu's lab at Harvard Medical School, um, where this is a, a single tiny loop of, 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 a, of a chromatin in a chromosome where you can see the loop closure in these orange and red regions, and each of these balls is a super resolution of uh, fluorescence. That's DNA, and this is RNA, where each dot stays in place, changes color with the G's, A's, T's, and C's, four colors. Um, and then the computer can look at each of those dots, which is a single RNA molecule, and tell you the name of that RNA molecule and where it is in the cell. That's a single cell with a single nucleus. So that's DNA, RNA. Now proteins, uh, these can be detected in a, in a somewhat similar way, but first you have to detect the protein with the antibody, and then you strap onto the antibody um, in advance a short DNA, which is what you then image with DNA exchange imaging, getting super resolution. Here we can see the components of the synapses, which were not, not visible in normal microscopy, but can now be seen with this DNA exchange imaging um, work from Yu Wang and uh, Peng Yen and their groups. Uh, this is, um, uh, you can even see excitatory inhibitory synapses. So the, the, the rich detail, uh, the multicolors tells you information about functionality. This super resolution of DNA, RNA, and protein and a, and a variety of other uh, omics uh, is possible through two different uh, companies, different instruments. Um, very complementary to one another. Uh, one is ReadCore and the other is Brucker Vutara, um, and they have uh, um, automated m most of the processes 
so that you can uh, let these run and, uh, and then software handles a lot of the image processing. Now using technologies like those for visualizing the molecules that compose each cell, we're not just looking at the shape of the cell, but the molecules that compose it, we can classify the cells. So this is a classification, this is not a microscope, but a classification of all the cells in a multidimensional space um, where we can tell each cell at each stage in development and aging um, has a different so-called epigenetic state and we can detect that via the RNAs. But more important than just dis detecting and classifying, we can actually recapitulate and we can make a cell move from any point to any point. We can make a cell older, younger, different, different cell type via transcription factors. And we have the first uh, complete collection of transcription factors um, from humans, 1,700 of them, and in expression vectors, and we can use it to make any cell we want um, in the right place um, and um, in the right co context. So here's, for example, two cells relating to one another, the oligodendrocytes and the neurons. These have been manufactured from um, cells from my body, but it doesn't matter. The point is they're stem cells that turn now into these two cell types where the myelin sheath is wrapped around the axon exactly the right number of times as it would happen uh, in vivo. And it is such a good uh, representation that when we put these two cells and uh, even cells of vasculature, all from, from human stem cells uh, now reprogrammed into a genetically, um, a ge genetic disease in, a, in an animal, we can rescue that uh, animal's disease by injecting these human um, uh, brain cells, uh, organoids, uh, and uh, can rescue it to normal levels. Uh, um, Alex and Paris do have uh, used a starter company called GC Therapeutics. That's a very small transplant. The organoids are still very uh, early and primitive, but they will improve. They are improving quickly. Um, even larger organs have, uh, can be made and, and are being made um, in uh, animals, in pigs. Uh, and this, is require, this illustrates where we're going in terms of not just transplants to solve the crisis in, in uh, availability that was mentioned uh, earlier, um, but enhanced transplants, uh, in organs that are resistant to immune rejection, resistant to senescence, to pathogens, and so on. These enhanced transplants are important for curing diseases, but also preventing uh, diseases. Uh, to get here, we had to change 42 different genes. This shows you how far we've gone from barely being able to change one gene to now being able to change all of the, all 42 of these genes in every cell in the body um, via germline editing. Um, this is uh, as in uh, use in clinical trials, uh, 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 preclinical uh, primate trials at Massachusetts General Hospital under the direction of Jim Markman. We have um, eight-month survival of, uh, of these organs in, in, in primates. And this is um, being, this all the R&D is happening at eGenesis in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in Kihan, in Hangzhou, China. Finally, there's protein engineering. A huge category of uh, new drugs is in protein engineering. Uh, and the problem, the, the bottleneck, the, uh, the reason that this can be expensive is that um, the very inexpensive tests, like in vitro in the test tubes, um, are not, uh, fail to be relevant to animals and humans. And even animals uh, uh, are, because as they become more and more expensive, they become more and more relevant to humans. So we'd like to have some way of maximizing the power at every, at every stage in this curve um, so that we get um, higher throughput um, but more meaningful output, um, l lower costs and fewer failures. One way to do this uh, is, is described in these two papers. Um, um, uh, many people in, in our group contributing to these, um, which are based on deep uh, learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, where one can pre-train on 20 million naturally occurring proteins 
and discover um, what substitutions are available in the amino acid space doesn't even require the three-dimensional structure for many things we don't even have the three-dimensional structure, uh, as you'll see in a moment. Um, and then this allows us to do um, uh, smaller uh, trials at, at great, uh, great expense um, using this background information. Any, any uh, example, uh, in addition to protein therapeutics, antibodies, and so forth, we've applied this to the very complex protein structure, the capsids of, that are used for delivering uh, new, new drugs like gene therapies, editing therapies, and so forth. And so we do a cycle where we can make very large libraries, say on the order of a million different designed viral capsids. We see how they behave, for example, which tissues they go to, which parts of each tissue, and we determine that by sequencing the DNA barcodes, such as I mentioned earlier, going through this machine learning step and cycling around learning uh, more and more. We've done a million, over a million different designed viruses. This is work from Pierce and Eric, uh, published in Science um, recently. Here's an example of data from that, um, where we have blood, heart, liver, kidney, spleen, lung, all showing different heat maps, where we have all the possible amino acids on the y-axis and all the possible positions in the proteins of the virus along the x-axis. Clearly, we can engineer viruses that have completely different targeting uh, ca capabilities. And this tissue tropism is, uh, is uh, one of the holy grails of delivery. Delivery, we need to not just have great drugs, we need to be able to deliver them either systemically throughout the body or in a very specific organs without off-target. Now, I mentioned at the beginning, and this is the last slide, uh, that we had an opportunity of uh, dealing with the most common diseases, most of which have an aging component, by focusing on the aging uh, part of this. If we can find a drug, or more likely a combination of very powerful drugs, very well regulated, that can tackle many different diseases of aging. Diseases have almost nothing in common uh, other than that they are age uh, exacerbated, age related. For example, high fat di di obesity, type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, cardiac damage, recovery, kidney disease, um, and the list goes on. Um, we hope to be adding to this um, neurodegenerative and cancer. But these diseases, uh, if you can get five at once, um, then you're probably getting at the core rather than dealing with individual symptoms. And this is exactly what Noah Davidson and his colleagues in, in my lab did um, and are now doing at Rejuvenate Bio, a San Diego company, where three different genes were delivered. These were genes that were chosen to be non cell autonomous, meaning that they, their impact goes beyond uh, where they've been delivered. And part of this is uh, while we're de developing better and better delivery methods, uh, we need to leverage what we have. And so these non cell autonomous were our top priority. And they did impact all five of these diseases. And we're moving on to other diseases and other um, uh, markets. For, for example, uh, veterinary uh, markets for, for pets is an uh, is important uh, milestone for getting to human. Uh, clinical trials, which will hopefully be happening very soon. So I opened with this slide and I'm closing with it um, to, to point at, uh, again that we can reduce costs and increase the wellness in this post-COVID uh, uh, climate by um, preventing rare and infectious diseases um, by uh, digital uh, uh, tools. We can increase the success rate via machine learning and, uh, and uh, protein libraries, nucleic acid libraries. And, and finally, common diseases are, um, uh, many of them can be thought of as age affected, and, and if so, then they can, uh, the R&D costs can be spread out over the entire planet. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, George, for your insightful presentation. Uh, before moving on, we will have a quick Q&A session for you. Uh, there is a, uh, one question reading from an interview in 2017. You mentioned that we will be able to stop aging in about five years. Uh, research on aging 
is making rapid progress, but five years seem like a short term to achieve such results. To what standard do you predict that we could stop the process of aging? So, uh, what we've achieved uh, in the article, peer reviewed articles that I showed in, uh, in, the, in the second to the last slide was uh, aging reversal. We, we aim for aging reversal rather than uh, longevity or immortality or s dead stop uh, because um, it's easier to apply to diseases that are already recognized by the, the world's food and uh, FDA equivalents, uh, regulatory agencies around the world. If we can get any one of those aging related diseases the, and the others come along with it, uh, then uh, we have uh, then we have a powerful inroad. And, and so I would say we've already demonstrated that, that, that five-year prediction, we're th uh, three years in now, uh, and we've shown, demonstrated this in animals, and we're looking forward to the starting clinical trials soon. It clearly is a working strategy. There'll probably be, um, hopefully be many others uh, that, we'll, that, that we're, we're already seeing a, a record number of small molecule drugs, protein drugs, gene drugs that are uh, applicable to the general problem of aging. Thank you for your nice explanation, George. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So next we have Ms. Susan Tusi, the Senior Vice President and Chief Product Officer of Illumina, a world leading company for genome sequencing. Ms. Susan Tusi has more than 25 years of R&D and business leadership within the life science industry. She will be sharing the presentation titled, Understanding the Genome, the Power of Next Generation Sequencing to Drive a New Paradigm in Healthcare. Hello, Susan. Thank you for joining us. Can you hear me? Hello, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear, please. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm honored to join the KAIST discussion and uh, really inspired by the previous speakers. Um, our mission is to unlock the power of the genome to improve human health. So overcoming diseases and extending our lifespan all for a better future for humanity is something I'm very passionate about. Um, in fact, we've been empowering the genomics community with array and sequencing solutions since 2000. And I look forward to talking a little bit about what we're doing with, uh, with the COVID disease. First, let me describe a little bit about genomics because I understood this might be kind of a mixed audience. Uh, it's a study of the structure, function, evolution, mapping, and editing of genomes. And a genome is an organi organism's complete set of DNA, including all of its genes, of course. Every cell in your body contains your genome, most of it in the form of the 23 pairs of chromosomes in the cell nucleus. And if you stretch all of the stringy material out, you would have the 3 billion nucleotide base pairs, A's, T's, C's, and G's, that make up your genome, your personal human blueprint. Illumina's Next Generation Sequencing Technology, or NGS, allows for accurately reading one base at a time in a process called sequencing by synthesis. And this enormous amount of data is then analyzed to determine the variants that can be related to disease. And most humans have about four to five million variants, um, not all of them related to disease. This technology has come a long way, allowing us to interrogate biology at a massive scale. Last year alone on our high throughput NovaSeq platform, our customers collectively produce the equivalent of a human genome every second. So what can you do by knowing your genome? And of course, uh, front and center to all of us right now is infectious disease. Um, the applications of NGS range from disease research, so studying the immune system genomics, pathogen host interaction, functional screens like CRISPR as mentioned, or RNAi, uh, virulence, pathogen evolution, or phylogeny, um, to public health surveillance, such as tracking of outbreaks, strain typing, and detection of pathogens. Uh, two applications in healthcare itself, so antimicrobial resistance and host response marker profiling. In the current coronavirus outbreak, NGS was used to initially identify the unknown virus from Wuhan province, and on January 10, 2020, the sequence was published to GenBank. 
linking it to the beta coronavirus genus. Since then, researchers have learned that this is a novel RNA virus, positive sense, single-stranded, and approximately 30 kilobases. So really, really tiny <laughs> compared to your genome. Uh, the use of NGS remains vital to the ongoing outbreak management to enable confirmation of PCR positive samples, viral evolution tracking, and development of vaccine candidates. In fact, uh, the progression of kind of the vaccine development has been accelerated by knowing uh, the genome of the virus from very early on. Um, but we have other applications as well, although, you know, the, the, the infectious disease is, seems to be consuming all of our thought right now. Um, oncology is a, uh, and where cancer is a disease of the genome, and NGS is being used for selecting the right targeted therapies, measuring the success of the treatment, and monitoring recurrence. Um, we're very inspired by the promising use of NGS for uh, cancer screening applications, so detecting cancer very early on or stage shifting it from stage four to stage one or stage two even. And companies like Grail are using uh, a blood-based test to look for cell-free tumor DNA in the bloodstream that you would do kind of as an annual checkup, maybe at a certain age, uh, you would start having this test um, and potentially you know, be able to trace cancer much earlier, saving millions of lives. Um, and there are other applications, population sequencing and consumer genomics. Array and sequencing products enable access to genomic information to allow individuals to be genetically informed on their state of wellness. In rare and undiagnosed genetic diseases, there are a lot of examples that are really front and center. When you have a child that's born with a rare undiagnosed disease, the family is often set into this diagnostic odyssey, and it can last many years and in and out of the hospital um, and really just wreak havoc uh, on the family and not to mention the child's health. Lumina sequencing is increasingly empowering researchers and clinicians across the globe to provide answers in terms of diagnosis, which can lead to life-saving therapies. And a number of these have been featured even on the front of Time Magazine and uh, Stephen Kingsmore, in, uh, who practices in San Diego Rady Children's Hospital, has been shown that he can do a diagnosis in less than 24 hours. Uh, in reproductive health, our solutions in NGS and microarray technologies deliver fast, accurate information that can replace invasive procedures such as amniocentesis. And in agriculture, we're advancing the future of agrogenomics through product development, collaboration with consortia, and interaction with the community. Our microarray and NGS technologies are helping researchers and breeders develop healthier and more productive crops and livestock. As mentioned on the previous slide, NGS has broad applications in the space of infectious disease. And knowing that this is front and center right now, as we globally grapple with how COVID is impacting those in our families and communities, uh, it's important to take a moment to really deep dive uh, our applications in infectious disease. Uh, we were the first company to receive FDA emergency use authorization for a sequencing-based test in the US called COVIDSeq. In the APAC region, governments are taking the technology forward approach in addressing this pandemic by implementing sequencing and a variety of uses. Here in Korea, the government is taking a holistic approach to understanding COVID infections, transmission, and evolution for surveillance and host genetic interactions using our NGS technology. Korea has also shown leadership in driving the understanding of COVID-19. As Seoul National University and recently published in Cell Magazine, uh, we, we know that there's several scientists in the world who've managed to sequence the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. However, the Korean research team um, at uh, Seoul National University um, used next generation sequencing along with other methods to release a more comprehensive map to reveal the location and characteristics of the RNA molecules caused by the tr uh, transcription process, leading to better understanding of infection pathway. Uh, the analysis of all COVID-19 RNA transcripts was, uh, was elucidated, confirmation of 41 chemical mutations, including methylation and the viral RNA. So really impressive work uh, out, of, uh, out of Korea. In Australia, through the MRFF funding, the Communicable Disease Genomic Network and Illumina are focused on using next generation sequencing to better understand SARS-CoV-2 behavior, spread, and evolution. 
investigate best practice methods to identify transmission clusters and events, use genomic modeling to further understand the reproductive rate of SARS-CoV-2, and assess the impact of pathogen genomics in the COVID-19 pandemic and how it will impact future outbreak responses. There's a lot to learn and to be applied to the future. In Singapore, we're collaborating with a number of research institutions employing high throughput use of COVID-seq. And all of these countries at a population level are seeing the differentiated value of NGS. This was highlighted mid last month by India's IGIB uh, with the first reprinted publication of a clinical validation of COVID-seq when compared to qPCR showing an eight to 10% increase in diagnostic yield not only enables them to resolve inconclusive qPCR results, but enhances testing capacity. India is aiming to have about a million COVID-19 tests per day available. Um, and due to the whole genome analysis approach allows for tracking mutations in the virus to better understand genomic ep epidemiology, monitoring transmission routes of the virus and its evolution. The global impact of coronavirus reminds us how interconnected we are as populations. Even though distance may separate us, common events impact us all. National population genomics initiatives are bringing research to the clinical interface to drive healthcare innovation. The power of these cohorts to drive clinical best practices for all individuals and the variation in our individual genomes to provide further understanding for our community's well-being is a virtuous cycle of learning as shown in this graphic. This global map shows the current PopGen initiatives. The focus of these is varied, covering elements such as generating clinical grade genomes at scale to improve the cost efficiency and quality of genomic data to drive new insights in health and disease, integrating actionable genomic medicine into routine care to improve outcomes, diagnostics, and prevention, mining aggregated real world data for novel discovery and to deliver real world evidence as data assets, providing economic development through job creation and spurring the local life sciences industry. Within the APAC region, we see examples of a number of these. In Korea, 1 million genomes of data will be gathered through the National Institute of Health. Uh, this is a Korea bio big data project, which will sequence 600,000 oncology and 400,000 rugged or rare undiagnosed genetic disease genomes. Japan Genomics Medicine Program started in 2015 to build infrastructure that can deliver data on clinical and population-based cohorts for drug discovery. Australia has multiple initiatives starting in 2016 to build infrastructure and drive better population-specific understanding of rugged and cancer. This was supplemented in 2018 by the Genomics Health Futures Mission, a $500 million investment in genomic medicine research to expand rugged oncology work and extend existing research to demonstrate the benefits of genomics and related technologies for patients and the health system more generally. As the use of genomics becomes more widespread, there will be increasing opportunities to tailor and refine the management of disease. This means ending expensive and avoidable diagnostic procedures and treatments. These PopGen studies are developing the clinical evidence to accelerate the use of genomics into clinical practice, especially in oncology and rugged. In 2017, Korea emerged as a true pioneer in the use of NGS for oncology, with all major top five hospitals using our panels under the NGS Panel Selective Reimbursement Program. The Korea HIRA approved reimbursement of NGS targeted panels for use in determining the presence of DNA and RNA genetic variants from tissue and blood-based samples to guide cancer diagnosis and treatment regimes. Since that time, consistent growth in the use of oncology, NGS panel assays, including Illumina's TST-170 and TST-500, have been observed with over 10,000 samples per year as of now. TSO-500 is being used as a representative NGS panel assay in a routine manner at several major hospitals in Korea. It is a pan-cancer product which assays 523 genes for assessment of DNA and 55 for RNA variant types. These markers are associated with current and emerging immunotherapy biomarkers plus MSI and TMB. The comprehensive test increases the opportunity to find positive biomarkers versus individual assays and has greater than 96% analytical sensitivity and greater than 99.99% analytical specificity. 
These attributes in combination provide a cost-effective and scalable workflow that can reduce the timeline for cancer patients from diagnosis to effective treatment. But as far as we progress in our ability to accurately sequence the genome, we still have tremendous ground to cover in our interpretation of the genome. And as we all can predict, AI is going to play an incredibly important role. The amount of data is just absolutely vast. And while we can identify variants today, placing them within a clinical context and identifying causal pathogenic mutations still remains a major challenge. And we will need all of the technology at our hands to do that. As of today, We've only characterized, if you can believe it, a fraction or 0.1% of observed genomic variation. Even with that, we're seeing the clinical impacts already, but just imagine what can be done in the future. This means that for rare and undiagnosed diseases today, many cases remain unresolved, even with whole exome or whole genome sequencing. For patients with cancer, while we have made significant strides in the ability to use targeted panels to inform therapy, with CREA being a leader, as I mentioned, the promise of whole genome sequencing and tumor profiling will be unlocked with improved interpretation technologies. However, there's still so much opportunity ahead and in the coming years, we expect sequencing to become ubiquitous in research and medicine. The insights we'll gain from sequencing, not just thousands, but millions of species and not just a million human genomes, but hundreds of millions will lay the foundation for a world in which nearly all diseases will be better understood and the lives of patients much improved. As proud as we are of the role we've played in enabling the advances of the past decade, we are even more excited and energized by the future. And I'm sure you see my slide here. Go back one here. And with these innovations, uh, we believe that the ability to transform healthcare is really at the tip of our uh, tip of our fingers. The volume of data has been growing enormously as we brought down the cost of sequencing, but still actually being able to re-analyze, um, assess that data, and the cost of storage is a bottleneck. Uh, large cohort studies, because of the cost and accessibility of sequencing, have driven powerful new insights. Many of them are mentioned here, um, but we still have to benefit from diversity from hypothesis-free uh, tests, as well as investing in longitudinal research to understand the effects of environmental lifestyle. Um, and although we have uh, driven standards to drive effective collaboration data utility, uh, there's a long way to go. And as we get to multiomics and other approaches, being able to harmonize that data and really draw vast conclusions from the complexity of biology is gonna be incredibly important. And uh, as we heard uh, from, uh, from uh, Dr. Church, there are methods that exist to make and modify DNA. And of course, CRISPR has such great promise for the future. Uh, we believe that the use of uh, genomics will allow for understanding on and off target effects to make the technology truly accessible and uh, to you know, really realize the impact on human health. And with that, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to talk with our audience today, and uh, we'll be happy to, to entertain a question. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, Susan. Uh, we will have one quick Q&A session for you, and the question is, uh, what types of diseases can be predicted if we are able to predict them? <laughs> well, that's um, that's a uh, crystal ball kind of question, but you know we we do believe that uh, being able to predict diseases in the future, ones that really you know kind of um, uh, elude us today, uh, is going to become possible. I personally am um, inspired by uh, polygenic risk scores and the opportunity for uh, for polygenic risk scores. As I mentioned, you know there are four to five million. Uh, variants and you know the uh, in most people's uh, uh, genome and uh, when you're talking about complex diseases, diseases that impact our lifespan, you know whether it's uh, heart disease or um, or diabetes or you know other things that happen as we age, uh, it's 
the link between the very complex number of variants across the genome, it could be hundreds or thousands that would predict uh, that disease um, are just not understood at this time. Um, but statistical methods like polygenic risk scores can allow us to better hone in and actually predict a person's uh, propensity to have, uh, to have one of these diseases and at least be seeking kind of more frequent uh, testing or treatment uh, until those links are fully understood. But there is you know, increasing evidence uh, that the polygenic risk scores will play an important role um, in a cost-effective and scalable way of allowing, uh, allowing us to understand whether we're going to get a disease. Thank you, Susan, for your nice explanation. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Ne Next, we have Dr. Kwang Soo Kim. He is a professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at Harvard Medical School. Professor Kim is the first person in the world to successfully carry out clinical treatments on patients with Parkinson's disease. His presentation today will be on personalized cell therapy for Parkinson's disease, hope or reality. Welcome, Professor Kim. Can you hear us? Hello. Hi, yes, welcome. Okay. Thank you. Uh, please. Yep. So can you see my slide? Yes, we can see your slides. OK. Uh, it is my honor to be a part of this very uh, meaningful uh, symposium. And I already enjoyed the uh, very inspiring talks by previous speakers. And now I wanna uh, switch gears from genomics and the gene uh, to cell. So my talk is about the personalized cell therapy for Parkinson's disease. So a uh, critical question uh, in uh, uh, biomedical science is uh, whether it is possible to use uh, patients' own cells uh, to treat incurable human diseases. So uh, personalized or autologous cell therapy for uh, degenerative disorders is a, a long-term dream for stem cell biologists. But this is not a new concept. Already, uh, transplantation of uh, hematopoietic stem cells has been used to, to treat uh, various cancers. Uh, but uh, uh, the question is now, can this personalized cell therapy using patients' own cells be applied to various intractable uh, human diseases? So to address that, a uh, very important issue is uh, cell fate or identity. And uh, for a long time, uh, a dogma of life science has been that uh, cell fates and identities are programmed and one directional. So uh, uh, like shown here, uh, egg and sperm uh, form a zygote, which is a master cell of the body. Uh, and zygote multiplies and differentiates and eventually form the whole body. And scientists have succeeded to isolate early stage stem cells called embryonic stem cells, uh, which are pluripotent stem cells, uh, which can uh, differentiate to all types of the cells of the body, uh, as shown here. Now, uh, to address the possibility of the cell therapy, uh, we have to think about whether uh, these cell fates are fixed or reprogram reprogrammable. Uh, in other words, uh, can these uh, terminally differentiated cells be reprogrammed to the very early stage pluripotent stem cell uh, through the de differentiation? And also, can these uh, terminally differentiated cells be converted to other uh, somatic cells through direct conversion or trans differentiation? This is the issue is very important 
uh, because currently uh, used the uh, stem cells like hematopoietic stem cells or other adult stem cells have very limited capacity to generate different types of cell. In 2006, a groundbreaking work by Professor Yamanaka and his team demonstrated that fully differentiated cells like skin cells can be reprogrammed or de-differentiated all the way back to the embryonic stem cell-like cells, so-called induced pluripotent stem cell or, or iPS cell, uh, which ignited uh, explosive interest both from scientific and the general uh, public because it may allow patients spe specific uh, personalized or autologous cell therapy. Uh, however, this is not a, a trivial issue. Uh, although this technology was uh, invented in 2006 and uh, Professor Yamanaka got the Nobel Prize in 2012, the personalized cell therapy is not here yet. Uh, we thought that uh, Parkinson's disease is a, um, a promising target disease for cell therapy because a hallmark pathological feature of a Parkinson's disease is age dependent and selective degeneration of the midbrain dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra uh, as shown in this cartoon. And this loss of A9 dopamine neurons is the main cause of uh, moral deficits in Parkinson's disease. Thus, Parkinson's disease is considered uh, for uh, cell replacement therapy. And uh, since 1980s, numerous scientists have tried the transplantation of different types of dopamine uh, producing cells in uh, animal models as well as in human clinical trial. And among these cell types, uh, transplantation of midbrain dopamine cells from aborted fetuses provided very promising outcomes. However, this uh, fetal cell transplantation has uh, ethical and practical issues and couldn't be uh, standardized as a uh, cell therapy. So uh, to address the uh, possibility of using iPS cells for the personalized cell therapy Parkinson's disease, we identified uh, key uh, issues as shown here. And number one is, is uh, the uh, reprogramming technology is widely available, but still it needs to be improved for generation of a clinical grade iPS cells from individual patients. And number two, obviously the most critical issue is that uh, to assure the uh, safety uh, strategy for this cell therapy. And number three, we have to uh, optimize the in vitro differentiation for scalable production of uh, transplantable cell, cell sources. And number four, we have to test then uh, the in vivo safety and efficacy in animal models and then we have to optimize the neurosurgical devices uh, for surgery. Uh, and then finally, we have to get the FT approval and take care of the regulatory and the clinical issues. So I'll uh, explain uh, very briefly uh, one by one of these key issues. So obviously the number one issue is uh, how to optimize the reprogramming technology to efficiently generate clinical grade iPS cells from individual PD patients. Uh, we noticed that our current understanding of the uh, reprogramming mechanism is still uh, incomplete and we paid our attention to a very interesting phenomena, so-called metabolic reprogramming, uh, which means that while the uh, somatic tissues like skin cells become iPS cells, their metabolism is fundamentally switching from uh, oxidative phosphorylation to the glycolysis. So like uh, cancer cells, these pluripotent stem cells and iPS cells uh, heavily rely on glycolysis for their energy metabolism. And during this process, we found that the uh, SIRT1 is increasing 
and so two is decreasing, which is a molecular signature of the reprogramming. And we found that there is a uh, pathway which is uh, OCT4 microRNA and SIR2. Uh, and this pathway is controlling the uh, uh, enhancement of the glycolysis and uh, the metabolic reprogramming and the somatic reprogramming. And based on that, we further identified additional microRNA molecules uh, which are directly involved in this metabolic reprogramming. And based on these uh, findings, we optimized the uh, combination of uh, microRNAs and uh, uh, in conjunction with the Yamanaka four factors and developed a uh, new reprogramming method which can efficiently generate uh, clinical grade iPS cells. The second issue is uh, uh, maybe the most important issue, which is the safety of the cell therapy. And we have to think about two aspects of the safety. The number one is, uh, as previously uh, 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 previous speaker mentioned, uh, genomic integrity uh, is critical. And we have to confirm that uh, the genome of the uh, iPS cells and dopamine cells are intact and there is no abnormal variations by the whole genome sequencing and uh, bioinformatics. And secondly, we also have to make sure that uh, there is a, a no remaining undifferentiated cells in the transplantable dopaminergic cells, because by definition, any uh, undifferentiated iPS cells can uh, generate teratomas and leading to the uh, cancer formation. So we devised a chemical method uh, targeting the uh, pluripotent stem cell specific uh, uh, factor uh, uh, surviving. And by using this uh, in a small molecule inhibitor, we could completely eliminate uh, the, uh, uh, any remaining undifferentiated cells with the efficiency of more than 99.99%. And notably, uh, when we treated the uh, surviving inhibitors, such as quercetin, uh, this treatment does not affect uh, the, uh, at all the uh, differentiated cells or even precursors. So by using this chemical method, we could ensure that in the transplantable cell source, there is zero remaining undifferentiated cells. Number three is the op to optimize the in vitro differentiation. And we uh, developed a novel spotting based uh, differentiation method for scalable production of transplantable cell sources. There are many uh, prominent uh, differentiation protocols published by many groups, uh, uh, but the most of these studies use the uh, monolayer culture. So in contrast to the uh, monolayer, traditional monolayer culture, uh, we devised a uh, new method called the spotting-based method, which means that uh, the cells are growing and differentiating in a uh, restricted area, uh, like in this uh, red spot. And as a result, uh, the dopamine cells differentiated using this method uh, were shown to be more healthier and also functional as uh, shown here by the uh, gene expression profiles and dopamine production and uh, different types of the uh, electrophysiological properties. Uh, so using these cells, uh, uh, differentiated dopamine cells, then we then uh, next uh, tested their in vivo safety and the efficacy using the animal models. So uh, when we used the differentiated cells for 28 days, uh, we found that uh, these differentiated cells do not form any tumor or any uncontrolled growth, and they did not uh, redistribute to the other parts of the body. And also using the uh, prominent uh, animal models of Parkinson's disease, we found that these differentiated cells very significantly or completely uh, rescue the uh, Parkinson-like uh, motor behavior dysfunction, uh, as shown here by the uh, reduction of the rotation behavior in the 6 hydrox dopamine lesion model. And lastly, uh, when we used the uh, patient-derived dopamine cells and tested them in humanized mouse models, uh, we found out that uh, the patient-derived dopamine cells 
uh, were survived very well without rejection in the uh, patient specific humanized mouse, while allogenic uh, dopamine cells did not survive and were all rejected as shown here. And number five, we also optimized the uh, surgical device. Uh, traditionally, we used the uh, bolus injection. And uh, as a result, the graft becomes a, a bolus uh, type, as shown here. But then uh, we devised, uh, modified the existing device. And by differential uh, moving rate, uh, we uh, found that uh, this uh, device can make a uh, columnar graft as shown here. And as a result, in this columnar graft, dopamine cells could survive significantly better than the bolus type uh, graft. So using this technology, we uh, contacted FDA in 2015 and submitted the uh, full IND application to treat the first uh, single patient. And with the seven times amendment, uh, we finally obtained the FT approval in early in uh, 2017. And uh, by uh, FTA's recommendation, uh, we uh, treated the first patient uh, through the two times of transplantation and the first surgery and second surgery. And this is the snapshot picture of the first surgery, uh, which was performed at the Cornell Medical School. And uh, this is the uh, surgical uh, room. And then uh, this is a snapshot uh, for the second surgery at MGH here, here at uh, Boston. And uh, our clinical team uh, followed the patient uh, very closely for the two years. And uh, uh, the results are shown here. The number one uh, message was that uh, this therapy was uh, safe. Uh, and uh, uh, there was no adverse effect such as hemorrhage or uh, tumor formation or uh, graft-induced dyskinesia. And number two message is that um, uh, the patient was rapidly worsening right before surgery, but after surgery, uh, that worsening uh, stopped and the patient uh, no more experienced any worsening of the disease. And uh, thirdly, uh, in terms of the improvement, we, uh, although the improvement was not very robust, uh, there were uh, evidences showing that uh, there was a, a clinical improvement. First, as shown in this PET imaging studies, uh, initially, this PET imaging uh, depicts the uh, function of the dopamine uh, terminals, and this dopamine function was decreasing. But uh, starting from uh, one year from the first surgery and uh, six months from the second surgery, uh, the uh, PET imaging shows the uh, improvement of the dopamine function and that it stays uh, improvement uh, all the, the period. And also uh, we, uh, our clinical team uh, closely examined all the neurological tests uh, in the uh, different types of the uh, battery of the neurological test, such as UPDSR. And uh, the pattern here, the less is improvement, and there is a, a tendency of the, uh, uh, the improvement in all criteria. And also the patient uh, showed the uh, quality of life was largely uh, improved. And uh, the patient regained uh, daily activities such as uh, tying the shoes with the laces and also sports activities such as uh, swimming and uh, skiing. And also uh, he, uh, he, the patient uh, voice was uh, became uh, clearer. So uh, this is the result. And in summary, uh, our study uh, showed that the human IPS-based personalized therapy could be a re reality, but the need much more study uh, because uh, so far our study is the N of one study. So we cannot conclude that we proved the uh, efficacy or uh, safety uh, as yet. So uh, however, uh, our study is uh, very promising and uh, fully support the further studies. Uh, and so we are currently uh, planning to do the uh, full scale clinical trial. Uh, 
uh, in my last slide, I hope that uh, I convinced you that cell fate are not fixed, uh, but rather uh, these cell fates can be reprogramming, uh, reprogrammable or uh, through the differentiation and their cell fate can be converted. And obviously, uh, as we heard from previous speakers, uh, Professor Church, uh, the CRISPR technology can furthermore enhance the uh, possibility of the cell fate changes and uh, these cell fate changes can be used for the cell therapy. And these results uh, remind me of the uh, uh, medieval era alchemist as shown in this picture, uh, uh, the painting by Joseph Wright in 18th centuries. And I would speculate that uh, today's biologists and bioengineers are cellular alchemists for tomorrow's medical revolution. And with that, I stop here and entertain any question. Thank you, for Professor Kim, for your insightful uh, talk. Uh, we will have a short Q&A session for you, and I have one question ready. Uh, the question reads, about 110,000 South Koreans die from Parkinson's disease every year. It is known to be one of the three chronic degenerative diseases, and yes. patients diagnosed with Parkinson's disease report of shaking, stiffness, and difficulty with walking, balance, and coordination. What improvement will be made if stem cell therapy is successful? I think that's a fascinating uh, question. And after our report, uh, I get the emails and phone calls from all over the world asking exactly the same question. And uh, since uh, we are replacing the dopamine, uh, lost dopamine neurons, uh, we expect that uh, because dopamine neurons are directly uh, regulating the motor dysfunction, motor function, uh, so we think that this uh, replacement of dopamine neurons can improve these motor related functions. Having said that, uh, Parkinson's disease is not a uh, simple uh, uh, disease. Uh, it has uh, different types of the motor dysfunction as well as non-motor dysfunction. So in general, uh, scientists think that uh, this non-motor dysfunction of the Parkinson's disease may not be directly benefited by this uh, dopamine cell uh, replacement or cell therapy. Uh, however, uh, at this point, we really don't know because the, there are very limited uh, cases, in, especially in terms of this uh, autologous personalized cell therapy. We have only N of one study, so we cannot, as I said, we cannot conclude uh, anything about the efficacy or safety. So we definitely need a much more uh, controlled studies in the future clinical trial to address more uh, questions. Thank you very much, Professor Kim, for your kind explanation. Uh, even being cautious with the limitations of uh, current status of your cell therapy, I see a, a very bright future moving forward. Thank you very much for your precious time. And thank you again. Thank you. thank you. Now, we will conclude our plenary session. I'd like to thank all the speakers for their excellent presentations and the audience to watching this online forum. I am Professor Seungbom Hong at KAIST. It was my pleasure to moderate the first half of our forum today. Next, we will continue with our keynote session and panel discussions with young scientists. So please stay tuned. Hello, welcome to the keynote session of today's forum in 
which we will continue to discuss gene-based personalized solutions to improving healthcare and, ex in, and extending human lifespan. We have four speakers with us today. Um, Jin Hyung Lee from Stanford University, Vera Gorbanova from the University of Rochester, Jung Ho Lee from KAIST, and David Resnick from the NIH. Each speaker will present about for 10 minutes each, and after that, we will open up the floor to discussion and take some questions from our pre-selected panel of 20 participants who are joining us online. My name is Sang Ali, and I'm a faculty member here at KAIST at the Department of Bio and Brain Engineering, and I will be your moderator for this portion of the GSI Forum. Our first speaker is Jin Young Lee. She's a professor of neurology, neurosurgery, and bioengineering at Stanford University. Her approach to the brain as an electronic circuit um, includes new therapies for a network-based and personalized approach to brain dysfunction. Jin Young also founded Elvis, a startup company that develops software based on individual neural circuit maps to diagnose various neurological disorders. Um, hi, Jin Young, nice to have you with us. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay. Can you hear please, me? Yes, please go ahead and start when you're ready. Thank you very much for the introduction, and it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, my lab's primary focus is to answer this one question, can we fix the brain like we fix electronic circuits? And we'll uh, have a chance to discuss this approach today. And so I've actually never met anybody who's not interested in the brain. And we want to first start by thinking about what we hope to achieve through brain science. And one of the main uh, focus on what we want to achieve includes uh, enhancing human capabilities and experiences, addressing our hopes and dreams. But on the other hand, we also have a very dire need to cure neurological diseases, as Professor Kim has just noted. And so in terms of enhancing human capabilities and experiences, they have been very uh, numerous times shown in various movies where we've seen cases where perhaps we can download new skills to the brain in a matter of seconds. Can we control a different body through our brain interface? And perhaps even download memory to our clones where you might even think about achieving immort immortality. And so while these are our hopes and dreams that are reflected in movies, uh, our reality relies somewhere closer to uh, this MC square device, even though this is more than 20 years old. Uh, the current state of technology that's readily available is uh, still at this stage. On the other hand, thinking about brain disorders, brain disorders are generally devastating. It's dramatically increasing in prevalence, and it has a common feature that none of them are curable. And the cost of care is also dramatically increasing where this is not only a matter of problem for the patients themselves, but also a socioeconomically a huge problem. And the numbers I quote here for just a few diseases that are uh, listed here uh, reaches at least two digit billions. And for Alzheimer's disease in particular, it's three digits and it's about to hit four digits in 2050 if we don't come up with a particular therapy that might address this challenge. However, the fact that we can't address any of these neurological disease to date is not totally surprising in a sense that we don't even know what the problem is at this point, where when we go to the clinic to try and ask uh, if you have a suspicion of a neurological condition and you go to the clinic, what you have is basically a counseling session where you, the doctor asks you questions to figure out what's wrong with you. You can imagine going to the Apple store with your phone where the technician just asks questions. You can imagine that could be a very difficult process to figure out what exactly is wrong with your system. But when I say that this is what happens in the clinic, a lot of the times people say, no, that's actually not true. When I go to the clinic, they do a lot of tests, they take MRI, they take blood tests. Uh, which is true, but that though, none of those tests are actually directly testing to see what's wrong with your uh, diseased brain. It's rather testing, uh, it's a test a diagnosis of exclusion where they're trying to rule out something that's easy to rule out as an alternative to an Alzheimer's disease that's very difficult to figure out what's going on. And because of these uh, lack of ability to address this very dire problem, uh, 
uh, we have exactly zero drugs in, on the market uh, that can directly address this problem where you can modify the disease. And notably, most recently in 2019, uh, there was a dramatic failure by Biogen, uh, which wiped out $18 billion from their market value. Uh, and this was not even uh, a drug that was definitely going to succeed. And this expectation was uh, important enough to have $18 billion in value, which was wiped out overnight. And even the exciting new treatments that was put into the clinical trial after that were not necessarily going to cure the disease. It was more along the lines of the group of patients that received the drug versus not. There was going to be a little bit of difference in the cognitive score. And this was in various contexts, not even fair comparisons. And the latest hope in the latest news that came out uh, regarding Biogen's Alzheimer's drug that was announced in August 7th, which boosted its stock price briefly, uh, was uh, a resurrected drug, the exact drug that failed. They uh, did uh, reanalyze it and found that the, these uh, might actually be hopeful. And so despite these very dire sets of problems that we have, strong market potential, why do we not have a solution to date? And I think one of the main reasons why we don't have a working solution is because uh, both at the diagnostic stage where you're trying to figure out what the problem is and also at the stage where you're trying to uh, treat the disease, uh, there is very little consideration about how the brain works in terms of the circuitry. And the reason why this is not fully taken into consideration is mainly due to technological limitations where these technologies to assess the brain function is not readily available. So taking a step back and thinking about it from an engineer's perspective, the brain is a circuit. How do we take control of our brain? One very important component is that you need to have a brain interface, an input output system, a channel to communicate with the brain system. And another very important element is that the input output system is not enough. You need to have an algorithmic access to the brain function where you can understand the inner working architecture and the software algorithm so that you can assess whether it's properly functioning. And if there's a problem, you can read and write brain uh, algorithms and codes to uh, fix the problems. And so in terms of building IO system, there's a very popular, well-known uh, update that was provided by Neuralink uh, in August uh, this year. And uh, as all of you know, Elon Musk uh, just announced that they have this new input output device uh, that can record from a thousand channels with a surgical robot that can potentially implant these devices uh, very easily. And they demonstrated uh, with a pig uh, that this IO device can indeed record from a thousand channels where you can uh, look at how the individual neurons are firing. And this is a important accomplishment in terms of having something that is clinically viable uh, commercially made uh, that was mainly in the research space. And there is indeed already a clinical input output device that has been used uh, for a long time, uh, which is uh, what's called the deep brain stimulator, uh, where you can see here in this x-ray image, the patient has these device implanted. Uh, however, the problem is, as I have just explained, having an input output device is just the beginning of solving the problem where you can't do, you don't necessarily know what to do with the device by just having an interface. And so the next very important problem that you need to address is to figure out what algorithms is the brain running so that you can use these interface to uh, fi start fixing the problems. And so what does it mean to understand the brain algorithms and why have we not achieved that? For one, trying to understand the brain algorithm means if there's a behavior like running that you see in this picture here, some of the approaches that has been taken to understand these, how the brain control this behavior, mainly due to technological limitation, has been to, uh, for example, look at cells. You put an electrode through the brain, look at the cells and say like, is that cell related to running? Does this cell fire when you're running? And another approach with new technologies, such as imaging that was enabled, um, allowed us to look at things like brain regions non-invasively, where you look at, is this region related to these uh, running behavior? And more, most recently, some of the things that has been looked at are looking at wiring. How are things connected in the brain? 
However, while these are very important information to try and start understand uh, how the brain controls behavior, it's not quite enough. From an engineer's perspective, what you really need is to have a comprehensive description of for a specific behavior, such as the mouse turning in this particular video, you wanna have a description of what algorithm was ex executed within the brain to elicit this behavior. And now with some of the technologies that we put together, we can start to have these cell type specific whole brain function, uh, circuit code algorithms deconstructed. And in this particular case, these are two very important circuits that are involved in Parkinson's disease and many other uh, diseases related to the basal ganglia thalamocortical system. And with this ability to get algorithmic description of what codes are executed during a very specific behavior. We can also now go down to the single cell level where you can see not only the algorithmic description of regional interaction, but you can then also try and reconstruct how different cells fired at each time uh, to get a more precise uh, understanding of how the circuitry functions. And importantly, um, for many neurological conditions, even though the goal of the disease treatment is to restore the brain circuit function where the algorithmic understanding is key, you need to understand the algorithm where you need to know what the problem is and the treatment goal is to restore the algorithm that was originally there. Another very important factor in neurological disease that you cannot ignore is the fact that there is hardware problem that you see. There's pathology that develop within the brain where you can start to see degradation of hardware. And to understand what the hardware's function is in relations to um, the software that uh, the system is running. We also did pathological uh, mapping during what's called the prion-like spreading uh, in, in the brain to see the uh, hardware degradation process and to map out what its relationship to a function is. And in this study, what we have also now started to understand is that not only does um, software restoration uh, set the goal for what we uh, wanna do, the software restoration actually also changes hardware where some of these hardware degradations start to reverse uh, when you change software. And so to go come back to this question of, can we fix the brain like we fix electronic circuits? Um, first, we looked at how we have no good way to diagnose, treat, or cure brain disorders. And this is a devastating and expensive social issue that urgently needs a solution. And one of the key reasons where I think the field has failed is that the brain's for circuit function restoration uh, due to technological limitations could not be set as the objective of the therapy. And this has been ignored in diagnosis and treatment of brain disorders so far. And in terms of how we start to take control of the brain circuit, we need IO systems as well as algorithmic understanding. And to come back to this question, the answer is theoretically yes. Once we have algorithmic understanding and the input output control, we can now start to have direct impact on the circuit in an engineering fashion. And so now we are starting to decode brain circuit algorithms where uh, in my lab, we can now start to make uh, large scale brain network algorithmic maps as well as uh, their individual circuit um, neuronal firing pattern as well. And what this means is that we can now start to build an engineering platform for the brain where you can start to predict what sort of changes, whether it is through cell therapy or drug therapy or uh, electroceuticals, we can start to plan out what circuitry restoration that we need to uh, have. And actually I was in Korea recently in early July for a forum and we had a panel discussion about drug discovery. And one of the key things is that so far all the drug discovery has been done in many cases in a treasure hunting model, uh, except for uh, some of the cases in ge genetics, uh, where it, it 
for example, at that time, SK Biofarm had a very successful IPO uh, that reached $20 billion valuation, but this was a result of 20 years of treasure hunting to get one drug approved. And so once we have this system engineering platform for the brain, we can start to imagine a uh, systems engineering approach instead of a treasure hunting approach where we might uh, be able to accelerate this cycle of discovery. And so with that, I'd like to end with my favorite quote. Of course, a lot of these things are a result of a long time uh, research, and this is definitely not the end of where we need to be, uh, but we hope to one day have a uh, approach where we can easily treat everyone everywhere in a very efficient manner. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Um, in order to uh, kind of have enough time for discussion at the end, uh, we'll save our questions um, until the end. Thank you. So we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, Vera Gorbunova, who is a professor of biology and medicine at the University of Rochester and the co-director of the Rochester Aging uh, Research, in Research Center. Dr. Gorbunova pioneered the field of comparative biology of aging, and her research seeks to understand the mechanisms of longevity and genome stability by studying animals who have long lifespans and are resilient to uh, diseases like cancer. Um, it's an honor to have you with us, Vera. Can you hear us? Yes. Hi. Uh, uh, please hello. go ahead and start when you're ready. Uh, do you see my slides? Yes. We do. Okay, so it's my honor to be here and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, the approach we are using um, to study longevity and then to develop interventions to e extend human lifespan are based on comparative biology approach. And the topic of uh, aging and longevity has already been introduced by previous speaker speakers. Dr. Zhao uh, talked you know, very well about the importance of aging research uh, and uh, how uh, fighting aging can help fight multiple diseases at once. Uh, and then Dr. Church uh, also spoke to this subject. So there are, of course, various approaches. This is a very fundamental problem of the society and of the modern medicine. So the approach we chose, uh, you know, we tried to do something different, uh, is to study animals that naturally evolved long lifespan. And so these animals already have mechanisms that allow them to live long and healthy lives. So we study those molecular mechanisms, and these are some of the model organisms <clears throat> that we investigate from uh, whales, elephants, to naked morads, which we work a lot on naked morads, uh, blind morads, squirrels, and I will speak a little bit about bats because they became very important animals due to the pandemic, but they're also very interesting for aging research. So our approach is to understand molecular mechanisms that allow these animals to live longer, uh, then engineer mouse models where we introduce those mechanisms using genetic engineering to see as a proof of principle whether these mice uh, can benefit from those mechanisms from long-lived species, and then if that works, uh, to develop pharmaceutical interventions that then will be more applicable clinically. So I will show you some examples of how that works. So one has to do with the naked mole rat. Uh, this is the longest lived rodent. It lives 10 times longer than a mouse, but otherwise they look somewhat similar. Uh, naked mole rat has multiple adaptations to longevity. It's resistant to cancer, to age-related diseases such as arthritis, heart disease, neurodegeneration. Uh, it was named Vertebrate of the Year several years ago uh, because of the discovery made by our group where the, we found that its resistance to cancer is mediated by this unique molecule, high molecule weight hyaluronic acid that is very abundant uh, in the naked morad. Of course, this is not the only mechanism. Uh, Dr. Zhao showed biomarkers of aging in his introduction. So here we have the same list of biomarkers of sort of hallmarks of aging. Uh, and naked morad has evolved adaptations to counteract pretty much every of those hallmarks. Uh, a lot of those uh, studies came from our group, so I'm very proud of that. 
uh, and hyaluronic acid was one of them. Uh, so this is for the naked mole rat. Can we transfer it to the mouse? Uh, we generated transgenic mouse uh, that contains naked mole rat gene for synthesizing hyaluronin. And what we find is that these mice live longer. Uh, they also show various health benefits. So now the question is, how do we move from this from this animal to this <laughs> to human? Uh, because you know, of course. Um, we heard a lot about CRISPR and genetic engineering, but you know there is still a long way to go to introduce it in you know in the way of fighting aging. Uh, so here we develop pharmaceutical approaches to achieve the same um, end uh, that will allow us to recreate the same milieu in a human patient, and this is a work in progress right now. So you can see that uh, from understanding mechanism of longevity that naturally occurred in a long-lived organism, we are on the path uh, to creating human interventions. So then another brief example, um, here are various rodents that we study. We wanted to see whether there is a correlation between DNA repair and long life. And this is a picture from the paper we published last year. We found that indeed, uh, Longer-lived animals have more efficient repair of DNA breaks. And the key protein that was responsible for it was protein called sirtuin-6, which is more active uh, in long-lived animals. And this is the uh, illustration we prepared for the cover, which shows that sirtuin-6, which is these pliers, it works much better in the beaver, which is a long-lived animal, versus mouse that's a short-lived animal and doesn't know how to fix its DNA very well. So based on this idea, um, we are now uh, developing activators for CERT6 protein because we know uh, that high CERT6 activity correlates with longer lifespan across species. It contributes to better DNA repair, also to suppression of line one uh, uh, transposons. I didn't introduce this function of sirtuin 6 but this is also a very important function, suppressing those transposable elements in our genome and maintaining genome stability. So now, of course, we could potentially, you know, use a gene editing approach and edit our sirtuin 6 gene to be more active, or we could uh, look for small molecule activators that people can take which, you know, maybe right now a more feasible approach uh, to again recreate the same mechanism in a human being. Uh, now a few words about bats. Uh, so bats are very interesting from longevity point of view because here we plot, you know, lifespan versus body mass uh, and bats are clear outliers. They live much longer than their size suggests. So that makes them extremely interesting. Uh, they evolve various adaptations for this long life. Uh, and the most striking of those adaptations is that they have uh, you know, reduced inflammation. So the immune system is very unique in the sense that they can handle viruses, so they can tolerate them. So now we are well aware uh, that bats serve as a reservoir for deadly viruses, including rabies, Ebola, and coronavirus. Um, so they can coexist with those viruses and don't suffer inflammation, uh, and that also helps them live longer. So we recently wrote a review on the subject where we showed that in bats, uh, they downregulate inflammation, so there are multiple inflammatory pathways that are dampened in the bat, uh, and the same pathway actually fuel uh, age-related diseases. So that helps bats not only tolerate viruses, uh, but at the same time, avoid age-related inflammation. Uh, and uh, we speculated that bats evolve this life, the, you know, this kind of immune system, because they live in very crowded uh, communities inside caves. They also fly, so they're exposed to a lot of pathogens. And they had um, 60 to 70 millions of years to adjust their immune system to downregulate inflammation and at the same time be able to fight viruses. So this is, you know, uh, something that um, their ecology dictated to them and that contributes both to their health and longevity. Now, humans started living in big cities only recently. 
Uh, and the, only for about 100 years, we started traveling around in airplanes, uh, which is you know similar to bats, so we are exposed to a lot of viruses. Our immune system didn't have time to adjust. Uh, but here there is something, you know, we, we don't want to wait for 60 million years to become like bats, uh, but we can use pharmaceuticals and learn from bats. So not only, you know, they give us viruses, but we can actually learn from them uh, how to uh, prevent those diseases and that tune our immune system differently. So based on those bat adaptations, there are already some drugs that target the same pathways like anti-TNF drugs that used to treat autoimmune diseases. Uh, there are various Sting and CGAS inhibitors uh, that are in development. Um, and uh, there are also novel targets that we can derive based on bad biology, because for example, these inflammatory genes from innate immune pathways are completely absent in the bad. Uh, and then uh, these drugs can be used uh, as anti-inflammatory, and then eventually they can also be used to treat age-related inflammation. So here is another example how we can learn from long-lived species and develop human treatments uh, based on these interventions. So, you know, to summarize this, I can say that um, various long-lived organisms can teach us the mechanism of longevity, and then based on them, we can develop interventions. So we talked about naked mora, bats, and, but we also study many other long-lived organisms. So this really opens a way to find novel adaptations that already evolved in nature, they've already been tested in nature, that uh, they are safe and they allow these organisms uh, to live long and healthy. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Vera. Um, those sound like really important lessons to be learned from um, other animals, and it may hold a key to our survival in the end. For now, let's move on to the next speaker. Uh, now we have uh, Kaist's very own uh, Professor Chong Ho Lee. Um, he's from the Graduate School of Medicine, Medical Science and Engineering, um, and his research addresses the fact that the difficulties in developing treatments for many neurological disorders um, is often due to a lack of understanding of uh, the, uh, the genetic causes behind these uh, diseases. So his approach to genomic medicine for incurable brain diseases has won several awards, including recently the 2020 uh, New York Academy of Sciences Innovators in Science Award. Um, he's also the founder of Sovargen, um, a startup company. Um, Dr. Lee, thank you for coming. Uh, please come on stage and um, you can start when you're ready. Okay, thank you uh, for having me this uh, wonderful and inspiring uh, forum. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. So today I would like to talk about the future of the genomic medicine for incurable the brain disorder. So as you... Okay. So as you may know, uh, there are the large the unmet medical need uh, in the brain the disorder. Uh, it's not move forward. Okay. So for example, uh, intractable epilepsy. Epilepsy is quite common, but more than one third of the epilepsy patient remain uncontrolled. Uh, especially the un uncontrolled epilepsy in children can lead to the permanent cognitive impairment. How about the brain tumors? So for example, the glioblastoma is most, the most common but aggressive brain malignant in adults. The median survival of this disease is only uh, 15 months due to inevitable the recurrence uh, in most cases. Uh, there is a lack of the understanding uh, the tumor origin of, uh, or recurrence uh, mechanism in this condition. How about the Alzheimer's disease? Oh, um, as uh, Professor Jin Young Lee already explained that, uh, there's a lot of failure in developing the Alzheimer's disease uh, based on the amyloid beta hypothesis. Uh, still, there's a lack of uh, understanding of molecular genetic codes uh, to develop the drug for the, this Alzheimer's disease. Uh, in the past, 
the most translational neuroscience research takes this kind of approach. Uh, research starts from the animal model by looking at the specific gene, uh, by get reading up, getting read, read of the, the specific gene and see what happens in the, this uh, animal model. There's any problem in the memory, any problem in um, the sociability, any problem in the behavior. Uh, based on the, uh, this understanding of the animal model, we can understand the fundamental basis of the, the human brain function and structure. So there's a huge breakthrough uh, in the understanding how uh, our, the human brain uh, recognizes uh, environment, or how uh, our brain uh, memory, uh, do the memory. Uh, however, when uh, the scientists apply the, this understanding to the patient, it was not successful. Uh, still, uh, there's a lot of the, the limitation for developing the, the drug for treating the, this kind of uh, brain disease, such as epilepsy, autism, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, and brain tumor. So there is a need uh, of the research, which starts from the patient to the animal to study the mechanism. So in order to understand the brain function, in order, order to understand the brain disease, we have to start our research from the patient. But it's not easy to, uh, to start our research from the patient. Uh, this uh, idea is quite the same in the industry. The, the global pharmaceutical company, including Novartis, uh, GSK, and AstraZeneca, shut down, uh, shut down the, their brain research uh, around 2011 because of the, a lot of failure in the developing uh, brain uh, drug for targeting the brain disease. However, around 2013, the global pharmaceutical company reboot brain the research again to develop the better drug. Behind this uh, change, there are the major the revolution advance in the science. It was the revolution of sequencing technology like the next generation sequencing. So Dr. George Church and Illumina are huge contributors to this uh, revolution of the sequencing technology. Thanks to the, this uh, sequencing technology, now we can uh, identify the cause from the patient. So regarding the, the human the mutation, there are two major types of mutation causing the human digits. First is germline mutation. Second is the somatic cell mutation. The germline mutation is arising from germ cell, like the sperm or egg. Uh, it can distribute all of our body, and we can easily uh, uh, use by using the next generation sequence technology. We can uh, identify the uh, genetic mutation in the blood or saliva. On the other hand, this uh, somatic cell mutation arises from somatic cell during the development or the aging. So somatic uh, mutation can be restricted in some cell or some organ, some tissue. So uh, with the help of the, this next generation sequencing technology, uh, scientists can identify uh, genetic uh, mutation in the germ cell level. So by looking at the, this uh, family pedigree, uh, and use of the de sequencing technology, the scientists are able to identify the inherited or newly arising de novo germline mutation causing the brain disorder. So as you may know, in many the neurological di disease have some uh, family history or uh, genetic uh, inheritance. So there's huge uh, effort to sequence the family with autism or epilepsy to identify the genetic cause uh, for this disease. And we, then we can, we can identify a lot of the uh, cause in this neurological, incurable neuro neurological disorder. And then what about the, the treatment? So in traditional draw, target this disease protein. However, the recent uh, advance in gene therapy, including the advance of the antisense oligonucleotide therapy uh, can, can, tar sorry, can target this mRNA by using the antisense concept. 
So this antisense drug can target uh, disease uh, RNA and regulate the expression of the disease protein, uh, thereby the treating the curing uh, of brain disorder. So there was a huge success of the antisense oligonucleotide therapy in spinal muscular atrophy, which is the very devastating, the fatal, the inherited neurodegenerative disorder in children. Uh, these uh, two scientists, Frank Bennett and Adrian Kreiner, uh, contribute the development of this antisense oligonucleotide drug called spinlazar. So this small, uh, about 20 base pair the nucleotide the drug can introduce into, into the uh, intrathecal root and then target the brain cell and target the gene. And now people believe that uh, gene therapy, including the antisense oligonucleotide therapy, is the next frontier for treating the neurological the disorder. Uh, unfortunately, so this strategy to identify the germline line mutation quite a, a straightforward, but this germline line mutation cannot explain all of the neurological disorder. For example, the very recently, uh, at People K, the huge consortium for sequencing the epilepsy patient reported that uh, some epilepsy, this germline mutation explain only 10%. So more than 90% of patients cannot be explained by this germline mutation. And then how about the, the somatic cell mutation? This somatic cell mutation can arise from the, in the brain, from the um, neural stem cell the, during development or the aging. So uh, including the, my group, uh, many scientists focused on the somatic mutation can be explained. The neurological disorder cannot be explained by the germline mutation. Indeed, uh, there is a huge uh, research about the brain somatic mutation in neurological disorder in, in many groups. So people, the scientists uh, now know that, that this brain somatic mutation is important, the neuropsychiatric disorder, neurodevelopmental disorder, including epilepsy, and neurodegenerative disorder. So KITES is one of the frontiers of the brain somatic mutation causing intractable, uh, untreatable neurological disorder. Actually, the, we identified that brain somatic mutation is responsible for some form of intractable epilepsy. We uh, developed some very precise detection method for the uh, genetic diagnosis. We identified the uh, somatic, origin of somatic mutation in pediatric brain tumor, which can be uh, the drugable target, and also we identify some origin of the mutation in the glioblastoma. We also found some association of the brain somatic mutation with the Alzheimer's disease. So based on the, this uh, advance, actually, we can actually help the patient. For example, this is the genetic analysis report uh, delivered to the clinician. Actually, the, this, this sample means that each individual patient, these patients are children, who suffer from intractable epilepsy and got the brain surgery for controlling the, their epilepsy. So we test their brain, we sequence their brain, and identify that uh, they have the somatic mutation, not inherited mutation. It means that uh, this mutation is not transmitted. So for this parent, uh, have has some worry about the second baby, because if this is inherited, they are uh, very worried about the second, second uh, baby, but in the somatic mutation case, it is very unlikely that the, this, uh, the second baby have the same the epileptic disorder. And how about treatment? Unfortunately, uh, this patient is not always uh, successful for the epileptic surgery treatment. More than 30% of these patients still have the seizure. So luckily, actually, we, we are developing some antisense oligonuclear therapy for the, this uh, patient. Luckily, uh, we found that some clinically available drug, which is already used for the anti-cancer drug, can be used for targeting the disease. Actually, we generated this mouse model by introducing somatic mutation using the CRISPR technology and found that uh, they have this uh, severe seizure, but when we you treated the, the drug, clinically available drug, we can uh, remove, uh, we can rescue the seizure phenotype. So now, in the Korea, we are the, doing the 
a clinical trial for treating the this intractable epilepsy patient with a brain somatic mutation. But uh, without a support of the government and institute and industry, this future of the genomic medicine would not be possible. So in uh, regarding that, the Korea government uh, recent, recently announced the innovative strategy on the bio health uh, industry. So Korea government raised uh, government invest in R&D uh, over uh, for the trillion the Korean won to develop the, the new drug. And thanks to the support of the KAIS, KAIS a huge support of the translating the research to the industry. Uh, we can found, uh, we found one uh, bio startup company called Sobargen, uh, which developed the novel diagnostics and therapeutic for incurable brain disorder. We successfully the, got a uh, series and uh, series B fund for uh, recently, very recently. So we hope uh, this, all of this effort to uh, uh, moving uh, this uh, future genomic medicine brain disorder forward. So finally, I would like to emphasize that the future of the genomic medicine for incurable brain disorder li look like this. So we can identify the genetic cause thanks to the, the gene, uh, sequencing technology, and then we can understand the disease biology of identifying the genetic variation using CRISPR technology and many more than advanced uh, molecular biology tools. So now we have some uh, genetic tools as well as gene therapy tool can help uh, this patient in terms of the diagnosis and therapeutic. Uh, with that, uh, I'll finish my talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee will be joining us online uh, for the discussion section of the forum in a few minutes. Finally, um, we have Dr. David Resnick from um, NIH's National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. So while we've been mostly discussing the potential benefits um, of biomedical research and, um, and genetic engineering, there are clearly social, political, and um, uh, ethical issues that we must uh, address. And Dr. Resnick will tell us a bit about his views uh, on these issues today. David, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, we can't hear you. Perhaps. Um, uh -oh. oh, we can hear you now. Thank you. You can start when you're ready. Okay. So um, I'm very, I'd like to say that I'm very honored to be at this very interesting and important forum with all these very talented and smart speakers here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ethics and public perspectives. Starting off, of course, as we've made so clearly aware of today through these presentations, there's lots of benefits of biomedical research and biotechnology and bioengineering, everything from the development of medicines and pharmaceuticals to public health interventions um, and public policy, lots of many different important uh, applications of <clears throat> biomedical research. However, advances in biomedical research have raised ethical concerns that have attracted the public's attention, such as uh, the public health risks of bioengineered microbes escaping from the laboratory. Uh, this was a concern uh, way before there was any discussion of it, uh, possibility of that were related to the pandemic we're facing now. Um, environmental and public health risks of biotechnologies, especially genetically engineered crops, foods, and animals. The risks of human experimentation, um, misconduct, bias, conflict of interest in biomedical research, especially uh, conflict of interest in bias and in industry funded research, and the risks and societal impacts of human genome editing. Public response to these ethical concerns has been there's been definitely been some backlash, although the public remains strongly in favor of biomedical research and supportive of it. There's been strong opposition to genetically modified foods and crops, especially in Europe and some other countries. Opposition to using uh, GM animals in research or in agriculture. Um, opposition to using uh, GM mosquitoes to prevent diseases. Um, 
opposition to using human genome editing for any purpose, including prevention of serious diseases. There's also been general skepticism and fear of genetic engineering and genetically, genetically modified organisms and general skepticism and fear of vaccines and other science-based public health measures. So science cannot support, uh, flourish without strong public support. Public backlash against biomedical research that uh, the public views as unethical could lead to decreased public funding stricter laws and regulations and increased distrust of science. So the public is interested really in science that he considers to be ethical. What makes science ethical? Well, here's some general principles of ethics and science that are, uh, you'll find these in a number of different ethics codes adopted by different professional societies. They also get um, put into law in, in many cases. I won't go through all of these right here, but as you can see, they include everything from honesty and reproducibility and um, protecting of human and animal welfare and things like that. So to earn and maintain public support, scientists must first and foremost be ethical. They must follow ethical principles and guidelines and relevant laws and make ethical decisions. They must, must also educate students and trainees in the ethical conduct of research. So social responsibility is a key part of being ethical. Social responsibility includes anticipating the consequences of your research, promoting good consequences and preventing or minimizing bad consequences and discussing your research with the public and the media. Engaging uh, the public concerning the ethical and social issues relate, raised by your research is part of what it means to be socially responsible. So engagement is kind of, I'd say somewhat of a new concept in the science policy domain. Uh, years ago, people used to talk about public education, uh, but what has emerged now is the recognition of the importance of engagement, which is a two-way street unlike education, which tends to be one way. So engagement includes the sharing of knowledge, information, ideas, values, and concerns from both sides. It is educational, informative, interactive, and collaborative. So it involves not only the scientists educating the public about what they're doing, but also the scientists listening to the public, learning about the public's concerns. Um, and e even if they're, they don't really um, agree with those concerns, at least appreciating what the public's concerns are about a lot of these issues. Uh, the public, including affected communities and stakeholders in some cases, should be included in decision-making concerning the development of new technologies and discoveries. Lack of effective public engagement was a key factor in triggering uh, public opposition to GM crops and foods. And I think that's one lesson that we have learned um, from the backlash against GM crops and foods in many countries. To avoid this outcome, scientists should engage the public early on in research and development. So there have been a lot of very interesting uh, discoveries and ideas and innovations discussed here today. And I guess it would be my hope as an ethicist that um, uh, what we are doing today does lead to much more public engagement about uh, this interesting and very important research. So um, that's all I have, and I welcome any questions or discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, the timing seems perfect now to open up the floor to discussion and to take a few questions from our online uh, participants, who you can see here uh, on the screen to my right. So we have some pre-selected questions that were uh, sent to us. Um, and here we have our speakers who are still here with us. Thank you for staying on. The first question is from Thanks. Alexander Sharapov. Alexander, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Could you please introduce yourself and then go ahead and ask your question? Um, sure. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Alexander, uh, a graduate student at the Bio and Brain Engineering Department. 
Um, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you for this great opportunity. Um, I would like to address my question to Vera Grubunova. Um, personally, I was fascinated by the comparative biology approach to aging. Um, however, I was left wondering, what is the best way of applying mechanisms protecting long-lived animals to humans? Are gene therapies the only option? And if not, uh, would a pharmaceutical approach be the most effective one? Thank you. Well, thank you, Alexander, for a great question. Uh, I addressed some of it in my talk. Uh, so I think both approaches are viable. Uh, gene therapy is, of course, very attractive, but uh, there are still a lot of, uh, you know, safety problems that uh, have to be solved because anytime we think about therapy against aging or a chronic mild disease, the bar is set very high for safety. You know, while gene therapy may already be used for fatal diseases, but, to, you know, to reach that point of safety uh, that it can be used just to you know, make people a little bit healthier, live a little bit longer. Uh, so, you know, there is still a way to go there. So I think in the meantime, pharmaceutical approach is more feasible as it can be more safely applied. And, and we can do both, as I showed you in my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, the second question is from Sangjun Kim. Sangjun, are you there? I'm here. Hi, can you please introduce yourself and then go ahead and ask your question. Hello, my name is Hang Jun Kim and I'm the student in the Cox University. In first, it was an honor to hear a good presentation. Thank you for giving me a chance to ask questions. My question is for Jin Hyung Lee. It's very interesting to diagnose and treat brain disease through models of brain circuitry. But the brain of living organisms is not independent from other systems of the body. I would like to know your opinion on the effect of this interaction and modeling the brain and how you can consider this factor in understanding neural circuitry. Thank you. That's a very uh, uh, insightful question. Uh, the brain is definitely um, something that is in existence to control all parts of the body. And so it is definitely not in isolation when we consider this. And of course, um, with the brain, like the gut brain interaction, the immune system interaction, there's a lot of different parts of the brain that people are looking at that has a lot to do with um, other parts of the body, not just the brain. Uh, but the key here that the key message that I'm trying to get across is that all of those are variable associated with your brain health and the brain health affecting the other part of your bodily health, et cetera. But the key goal in treating brain disease and keeping your brain healthy is to keep its function intact. And so um, if you can characterize the brain's function where you know this is normal, this is kind of abnormal, the goal is no matter whether it is through uh, repopulating your gut microbiome, whether it is through peripheral intervention of your peripheral nervous system, whether it is to genetic therapies, whether it is through cell therapies, the goal ultimately is to restore the circuit function. And so it is the objective function that you need to define and work towards the goal of restoring. And so, um, Yes, it is. It should be considered in context of everything. And in fact, the brain circuitry model should have these uh, various uh, variables uh, taken into consideration. But the main key point is that the goal is to restore the circuit function. And by being able to measure it, uh, you can start to uh, understand the various variables role in restoring the circuit function. Does that make sense? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Hyun Chang Oh. Hyun Chang, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I am here. Do you hear me? Yes. Can you please introduce yourself and then ask your question? Yeah. Hello. Um, my name is Hyun Chang Oh from School of Computing, KAIST. Uh, my question is for Dr. David Resnick. Uh, so, correcting human problems and possibly enhancing the physical human bodies is often the goal of bio and medical engineering. 
But however, political scientist Francis Fukuyama once described transhumanism as the most dangerous idea. So it's an attempt to remove this fundamental equality that is susceptibility to diseases, death, and other physical constraints of human race dangerous. And how can we approach scientific and technological advancements to minimize such concerns? That's a very interesting, that's a very important question. Um, I think it's, it's something that, that has to be uh, addressed um, at, a, at, a very, at a public level. I think the, the worry I think is that these technologies are not going, one of the worries is that their technologies are not gonna be widely accessible. And so what you may have is an increasing gap between the rich and poor or diversification socioeconomically based on access to these technologies. And that is, um, I think that is a real uh, important concern that does need to be addressed. Um, but but it, it, it's something that um, it's, we're not quite there yet. This, that still remains a, a futuristic concern. I don't, I don't see that as happening today or tomorrow, but certainly over time that has the potential to happen. Um, so I think it's a question of trying to make these technologies, if we're going to move forward with them, widely accessible. Thank you, David. Um, while we are on the topic of ethics, I'm, I'm sure many of you get asked this a similar question about the um, ethical concerns and issues um, related to uh, biomedical or um, genetic engineering research. Do any of the other speakers have anything to add in terms of um, issues of ethics? Uh, yeah, Jenny. If I may add, <laughs> um, I, I, I think all of the technologies, fascinating technologies that we've discussed already have a potential to make very significant ethical social implications. And on that note, I mean, one way to go about it is to say, we're not gonna pursue this because it has this danger, but I don't really see that happening. Uh, one of the key things that I think we should all remember is that it's not the tool itself, but it's the user who ha holds the responsibility to have ethical um, boundaries. And so I do think it's very important to educate everyone on the importance of how um, we use any technology. It's like, if you have a knife, you can, it could be a murder weapon or you can make uh, a lot of good things out of it. And so just like that, even all the new technologies that are coming forward, um, having uh, virtue, value education, ethics education uh, to all the participants uh, is a very important part of it, I think. Thank you very much. Um, do any of the other speakers have anything to add to that? Well, I would like to add that, yeah, we often hear this concern, especially as it relates to aging research, like should we really try to extend lifespan or maybe uh, there is a ethical problem associated with it, but uh, because aging is the cause of a majority of diseases now in developed world, um, to me, this question is like, well, well should we treat uh, uh, heart attack? Should we treat tuberculosis? Of course we should, and the same applies to aging. And uh, it was also mentioned earlier today in one of the talks that the problem we may be fa facing is actually decline in the population, not overpopulation. So I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think this should stop us from pursuing research and doing what we're doing. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, let's move on to the next question um, from Eunhang Lee. Eunhang, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Eunhang Lee. I'm Doctor of Science Education. I teach students at Ihua Women's University. Uh, first of all, thank you for a wonderful presentation today. Uh, my question is, um, if stem cell therapy can be used to make dopamine neurons, to treat Parkinson's disease. Is it possible to use customized cell, uh, stem cell therapy for many other kinds of brain disorders or even cancer? 
um, what kind of new research is happening in this field and what are its main limitations? Thank you. Um, so Dr. Kwang Soo Kim is still with us. Um, Dr. Kim, would you like to uh, answer the question? Uh, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, actually, um, after our uh, report, uh, I got many uh, email requests uh, asking very similar question and from the families of other types of uh, uh, brain disorders. Uh, whether you know uh, our technology can be used uh, for different types of uh, uh, brain disorders, and that's a very uh, you know uh, fundamental and significant question. Uh, the short answer is uh, you know we don't know yet, right? Uh, because uh, you know Parkinson's disease is one of the most promising uh, diseases for cell replacement therapy because uh, we know that uh, uh, the cause of the Parkinson's disease is the uh, degeneration or loss of a single type of cells. So that is a much more straightforward situation. Nevertheless, even in Parkinson's disease, uh, this cell therapy is not very standard therapy, and we need a lot more uh, you know, research uh, to uh, show that uh, this cell therapy can be a, a standardized uh, treatment for Parkinson's disease. So uh, in short, uh, in, you know, in contrast to the drug treatment or even gene therapy, uh, this cell therapy is a relatively new area. So having said that, uh, in theory, uh, I think you know, if the, uh, uh, any disorder which is caused by the uh, degeneration of certain types of cells, uh, this same idea of the cell replacement therapy or personalized cell therapy can be applied uh, with more research in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, we have one final question. Um, and it's from, oh. I've lost the name of the participant. So I'll just read the question out. Um, is the, what is the main bottleneck of gene therapy to become widely used and commercialized? And perhaps um, based on uh, the fact that we are the Global Strategy Institute, um, particularly with respect to, oh, here he is. Hi, <laughs> sorry, I took your question. Would you like to introduce okay. yourself and uh, repeat the question and <coughs> expand on it if you'd like? So, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Jin Yuan Sung at KAIST. Firstly, thank you for the good presentation. And I have one thing to ask. My question is, what is the main bottleneck of the gene therapy to become widely used and commercialized? Okay, thank you for the question. So I was uh, actually expanding upon that, um, thinking that several of you have already experienced these challenges firsthand, and um, perhaps you have uh, um, you know, your own experiences that you can tell us about. But um, based on the Global Strategy Institute's um, uh, kind of perspective, I'm also curious about whether the commercialization on a global level presents some particular challenges uh, uh, to this problem of uh, commercializing these kinds of, um, kind of state-of-the-art therapies. Um, to get us started, uh, perhaps um, Dr. Tongo Lee, could you Yeah, so address? can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I can start with the question. So that's very important uh, question. Uh, so I think the most important issue is the safety to, for the commercialization of gene therapy. So based on the research, we know that many gene therapy platform work very well for targeting the disease causing gene. However, we are not very sure about the safety of all kinds of these platforms. For the, the brain disorder, the, so far, the only the antisense oligonucleotide therapy or the AAV viral vector was approved by the, the FDA. So I think in order to uh, commercialize uh, more the platform, we have to uh, know about the safety of the uh, gene therapy platform for the long-term use. 
Thank you. Do any of the other speakers have anything to add to that? Perhaps, um, Susan, you have something to add? Or... Uh, sure, I mean, I can share my perspective. I, I think that, um, uh, like you know, some of the other panelists have mentioned, uh, we can't shy away from the ethics of uh, these really game-changing technologies. And uh, when you think about rare disease and the suffering of, uh, of people who have these genetic disorders and suffering their family um, and the potential that you know, changing one letter could, change, could dramatically change you know, the life of an individual. Um, I think picking something that is uh, achievable and that has a real uh, incredible life-saving value um, with you know little downside if you're if you have the technologies to make sure the on off target uh, effects are as you expect um, really developing it out uh, with the guidance of you know the regulatory bodies and you know with the right ethics involved um, I think that you know we need to show kind of a first you know major uh, uh, case and, and there have been you know great cases shown in the treatment of genetic uh, eye diseases and and others so. Um, I just think we, we have to kind of take these one at a time and the ones that show dramatic um, you know, value to human life uh, and manage the downside. That's, that's my perspective. Thank you. Um, so we're nearing the uh, end of our forum now. Um, I would like to give each of the speakers a chance to kind of you know, make some concluding remarks if you'd like. Um, uh, Dr. Church has also stayed with us throughout the forum, and so perhaps you know you have some concluding remarks for us, or anyone. Please feel free to jump in. Well, I'll just I'll just use my concluding remarks to finish uh, that the topic that was just brought up, which I think is important, which is how we make widespread a therapy like gene therapy, and widespread could mean uh, addressing all individuals with a rare disease, or they could, it normally means widespread meaning hitting uh, as many people on the planet as possible. And uh, that seems to just keep coming back to this issue of uh, age-related diseases. Um, and the key to making that available in addition to long-term safety, which I agree with, uh, is, um, is the opportunity to bring down the cost because you're using, um, you're amortizing the research and development over a very large uh, set of people. But it has to be even safer than one that's uh, f a drug that's focused on a very um, acute and uh, or or very um, impactful, uh, immediately impactful disease. Anything that's preventative. Uh, or deals with an initially healthy person has a particularly high bar for, for um, introduction and uh, long-term uh, safety. Okay, thank you very much. Do any of the other speakers have anything to, to say for your concluding remarks? All right, thank you very much. So, I have a oh, yes, sure. Yes, please. I, just a brief concluding remark. Um, I guess I'd like to say that in my understanding experience, uh, science, engineering, and technology tend to move ahead way faster than ethics and the law. And so what we have to realize now is that, you know, the incredible pace of the change that we're seeing and that human society is just not completely ready for a lot of the changes that we've been talking about here. And if we want these changes to happen successfully, I think it means taking some time to just pause and get the public on board and let the public understand and have the public be a part of the process so we don't rush ahead too fast with the science before we've made the right ethical decisions and, and the regulatory and legal decisions we need to make about uh, these incredible advances that are happening. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much. So unfortunately we are um, now out of time and we should allow our uh, speakers in the US to finally go to bed. 
Uh, thank you all for sharing your knowledge and views with us today and for helping us come together uh, through this forum to take some time to think about uh, the future of bioengineering and medicine. Uh, many thanks to our online participants and uh, for you, the audience, for watching. Uh, this is Sanali at KAIST, and it was my pleasure to moderate the second half of our forum today. To close, I would like to invite onto the stage uh, for some con concluding remarks, Professor Chung Ho Kim, the director of the Global Strategy Institute. Professor Kim. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The world remains in a state of crisis due to the COVID-19 pandemic that suddenly revealed its head last December. We are seeing significant spikes in the number of cases, not only in Asia and Europe, but also in the United States. That what is worse is that it is extremely difficult to predict when this crisis will come down or when it will finally come to an end. Some fear that it will remain as a permanent part of our lives. Furthermore, we, are, we have seen human life expectancies steadily grow by the help of healthcare and technologies. Many predict that we will soon enter an age where we can finally cure cancer and prevent diseases through the genetics. We may reach a point where we will stop aging as a whole. Therefore, our efforts cannot be solely focused on medical, biological, and pharmacy technologies, but also on establishing the economic, social, cultural foundations for a new age in humanity. We must, we must ensure that every person on the globe equally receives the benefits of such breakthroughs. Mankind is currently facing a major challenge, and we face it together. In the face of such challenge, the importance of collaboration among the nations, individuals cannot be stressed enough. Only by working together, we will be rewarded with the end of COVID-19 pandemic, as well as with the equal opportunity to enjoy longer and healthier lives all together. That in mind, uh, that was the motivation that drove the KAIST Global Strategy Institute to host this online international forum today. My deepest appreciation goes out to all the speakers who shared their vast knowledge and deeply valuable thought with us today. I also would like to thank many hardworking individuals who made this forum possible. To all participants and guests who joined us today, we look forward to seeing you again in December, possibly for our next forum on rebuilding the world economy in the post-corona-19 era. Thank you very much. Have a nice lunch. <laughs>